Okay, good morning, everyone, uh, my dear colleagues and uh, friends from overseas. Uh, this is the third day of this year's uh, Taipei Valve Summit uh, 2020. Uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the meeting has to be go digital. And uh, uh, we thank very much to the organizing committee and the secretariat. Uh, who hold the wonderful meeting already for two days. Uh, today, the topic uh, or the main theme will be the imaging modality application in structural heart disease, uh, including uh, transcaster for uh, aortic valve and the mitral valve, and also uh, tricuspid and the pulmonic valve. So I think uh, I always say that uh, imaging uh, is the third eye of interventionist or cardiac surgeon, which can provide precise evaluation and the guidance of the procedure. So I think uh, imaging specialist is of paramount importance in the heart team. So today we are very happy uh, to have two sessions. The first is imaging in structural heart disease. Uh, uh, today the topic uh, a, a bit changed, and uh, we start from the second one, that is uh, Dr. Huang Guanzi's topic, uh, uh, entitled "Mental Coagulation of uh, Fluoroscopy, CT and T for Localization of Aortic Power Valve Leak." Uh, I think uh, uh, fusion modality is the future, and uh, I think uh, uh, we should learn something and uh, get a. Um, more uh, concise and uh, concept in this field. I think uh, Dr. Huang has st spent a lot of time in this field, so I think his uh, lecture will be very uh, informative. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Huang. Please uh, go ahead for your first talk. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. KC Huang from Zhenxin <coughs> Hospital. And uh, I'm happy to share my uh, some experience about uh, mental co-registration between different uh, imaging modalities. And uh, for example, I will use the localization of aortic PVL uh, to show my concept. The most important thing uh, for treatment of uh, power valve leakage on angiography is to find a, a gantry position. It can uh, demonstrate the uh, dehiscence or defect outside the uh, surgical valve. And uh, then we can cross the guideline tangentially for the follow-up steps to complete the treatment. We've already know that uh, gated MDCT is a very useful tool <coughs> to help us find the gantry position because we can use the NPR manipulation uh, to find the uh, CT section and uh, the uh, corresponding the angel angles of for angiography tube will be demonstrated. And uh, we've learned that LL IL degree is more important, <coughs> but some difference in cranial caudal degree, uh, cranial caudal angle is uh, can be allowed to minimize the uh, exposure of radiation. But uh, CAT scan has some shortcomings. The first is it only shows dehiscence, but not the regurgitant jet. And uh, sometimes we cannot identify a dehiscence, especially for a PVL after TAVR. After TAVR, we need to uh, immediately evaluate the condition of PVL to decide the uh, first treatment strategy, such as post dilatation deploy a second device, or leave it alone and uh, evaluate the uh, accrued in the future. So <clears throat> apparatus uh, commonly order a shell acid, acid view from uh, echo guys. And uh, uh, some uh, experts suggest we can use the uh, shell acid view to uh, qualitatively decide how to uh, manage the, the and geography tube. For example, uh, if we go RAO, we can have a green 
PVL and the yellow PVL outside the uh, tether valve so we can treat the PVL nicely. But uh, there are some tricks for choices. The first is uh, explain. Because uh, sometimes it is difficult to directly demonstrate the, show, the nice choices view. So we will use uh, uh, the function of a 3D probe, the explain, to find the uh, orthogonal section. But uh, actually, the explain derived the choices is a mirror, left right mirror image of a traditional show axis view. So we need to know this, or the uh, treatment of PVL will just go to the apostasy, apostasy site. The second thing is uh, we have to know that a transthoracic echo show axis view is actually an upside down mirror imagery from the transesophageal choices. We will use uh, bicuspid for examples and then you can understand the uh, orientation nicely. Actually, the uh, LA goes to the lower part and the RV goes to the upper part. So uh, they are upside down mirror images. Even though the operator uh, is very familiar with such uh, mirror image tricks, Short uh, Xview still have some shortcomings. The first is uh, half annulus is under the shadow of prosthetic or calcium. And the short view uh, might sometimes underestimate the eccentric PVL jet. And even with fusion imaging, because uh, the short view will, uh, can be only demonstrated on extreme angles, so it is not easy. To, uh, de to demonstrate choices even with fusion imaging. So some experts su uh, suggest to use transcatch reviews to uh, evaluate the aortic power variable leakage. As you can see, uh, after uh, the table deployment, we can uh, investigate the uh, lift openly nicely and uh, because he allowed a multi-angle rotation so we can actually uh, investigate the whole circumference of uh, our annulus. And uh, because the regurgitant jet is parallel to the uh, echo scanning beam at uh, transgastric views, so we can uh, evaluate the PVL track nicely. But the biggest problem for transgastric, uh, transgastric TE views is disorientation because uh, most of uh, us uh, is, are not very familiar with this kind of views. So how to solve this problem? Fusion imaging. But as uh, demonstrated on yesterday's uh, lecture, fusion imaging will uh, overlap uh, echo onto the fluoroscopy with a rotated and sometimes skewed. Uh, orientation. So if we are not very familiar with traditional echo, fusion imaging might sometimes become confusion imaging. So how to solve the problem? Actually, uh, different imaging modalities are based on different kind of uh, mathematical coordinate system. For example, uh, traditional MDCT MPR is based on the Cartesian coordinate system, uh, that is XYZ, uh, spatial coordinate. For uh, angiography, because the tube uh, is actually uh, moved on the uh, orbital of a spherical coordinate system, and the angel is uh, projected from the direction of angiography tube. So it is actually a spherical coordinate system. And uh, for TEE, uh, if we uh, imagine esophagus as a Z axis, then the TEE probe is advanced and withdraw along the esophagus along the Z axis and uh, demonstrate the uh, sector imaging on the 
uh, its circular face. So it's actually a cylindrical coordinate system. As you can see, the number one TE figure is a transgastric short axis view, and the number two is the mid esophagus short a four chamber view, and uh, the number three is the uh, mid esophagus two chamber view. So with uh, such uh, some imagination, we can uh, do a 3D puzzle, uh, and and you can see the montage here. This is actually the relationship between these three TE images. So how does transcatch view look like on fluoroscopy? Here is a zero degree transgastric TE imaging. Here is the LV, the mitral valve, LT valve, a setting alta, right ventricle. So this is what it looks like on my pseudo fusion imaging. It is actually an echo, and this is a TE probe in the transgastric position. So as you can see, uh, the, because the TE probe, when it comes in, goes into the stomach, uh, it needs to turn to the left around the 90 degree. So the TEE -E zero degree transgastric view perspective is actually similar to the RAO 90 degree. We have uh, report uh, some uh, technique to uh, mimic TEE perspective from the MDCT MPR manipulation. We can simulate the probe movement, uh, simulate the advance and the fraction on sagittal MPR plane. We can simulate uh, counter characterize or characterize rotation means turn to the left turn to the right, rotation on the axial plane. And uh, we can do the TE 0 to 180 degree rotation on corona MPR plane. Here's an example, because we can uh, easily identify the tract of esophagus on a sagittal plane. So if we move the crux of uh, MPR uh, line, the center, the region of interest along the yellow esophageal tract, <coughs> we can simulate advance and uh, withdraw. And uh, we can rotate the MPR line to simulate the ritual flex. With ritual flex, the TE four chamber view, the sh four shortened TE four chamber view will be correct into a nice uh, TE four chamber view. We can simulate, we can rotate the MPR line to simulate the turn to the left. And uh, we can use the rotation of MPR line on the coronal view to perform a uh, rotation. We have some uh, dynamic video later. For um, the first, the most important thing is because uh, traditional MDCT looks from the button of the patient. But TEE perspective is actually looks from the top of the patient. So the very first step to simulate the TEE perspective on MDCT is to invert the Z axis. So this is what happened after we invert the Z axis on a sagittal view. So you can see the uh, orientation of imaging is become upside down. Then we move the center of MPR line into esophagus. And then we do the turn to the left rotation and the, let the blue line cross the apex of the LV. At the left time, on the sagittal view, we can see the red line did not cross the LV apex. So the four short, uh, here is the four shortened four, sh uh, four chamber view. Because uh, please look at the, the right lower part. This is what happened uh, when we do a uh, ritual flex. We do ritual flex, and the uh, four shortened 
full chamber view will be corrected. After we have uh, uh, corrected the full chamber, full chamber view, we can do rotation on the coronal MPR plan to get a two chamber or a three chamber TE views as you want. This is what happened when we do a, coron do a rotation on the coronal plan. So the four chamber view become two chamber view and they become three chamber view. We can also simulate transgadget TEE. Invert the Z line first, and uh, we move the region of interest into esophagus. Here's the esophagus. You can see some gas here. Then we advance the hypothesize the TE probe into stomach. You can see the region of injury will go to the left uh, impossible, as possible. Then we uh, do some rotation to have the sec center of TE sector go through the uh, LT valve. And we can do a rotation. As you can see, we can investigate the whole circumference of the uh, annulus nicely. And the one tip he, here is, if we move the region of interest into the aortic valve area, then when we do the rotation simulation, we can co-register the annulus of the transgastric view into a show axis view. And the least Perspective is actually a show axis view of uh, of a TTE show axis because LA is in the lower part, uh, right ventricle is in the upper part. Here is the tricuspid valve, and uh, here will be uh, RVOT. So with CTMPR, we can have uh, we can simulate. Uh, a uh, view, transgastric like TEE plan here. And uh, we will have the TTE show SV like plan here. And uh, the right lower part is actually a vertical flip of the S plan of the simulated TEE perspective. So we can have a S plan combination once we uh, do a vertical flip of the right lower image. Because uh, sometimes when we uh, do NPR, the derived angle will become uh, not very common. For example, it will be a LL 180 degree. So we need some uh, mirror image formula to change this angle into more possible angles. So for mirror imaging of uh, IO and L, the summation of the absolute value will become 180 degree. And uh, for the cranial caudal direction, the summation, uh, the, the, the absolute value will actually become the same. So the cranial 30 degree is actually a mirror image of caudal 30 degree. So with this uh, technique, we, as you can see, we can actually demonstrate the almost similar, almost identical perspective of TEE and uh, uh, MDCT MPR. Here is the LV, the mitral valve, the right ventricle, LT valve, and the ascending LTA. So as you can see, the TEE zero degree is uh, identical to around RAO 90 degree. Because when the TEE probe go into the stomach, need to turn to the left around 90 degree. So for another example, a TE 120 degree is of uh, identical orientation of LAO 30 degree. Here is a LV, a mitral leaflet, 
He has a left man, left circumference. And you can see the left man and the left circumference on TEE here. His uh, left atrial appendage, and uh, here is left atrial appendage. Then here is the LT valve and the ascending LTA. So we have solved the relationship between TE rotation degree and the fluoroscopy projection angles. For transgastric view, the TE X degree is identical roughly to IL 19 minus X degree. And the LL or LL X minus 90 degree when X is large than 90. So uh, we have prepared some uh, Easter eggs for the friends of Taipei Valve 2020. Uh, we have uh, prepared some combination of the, these uh, images at a different degree. So we help everybody can, uh, this is, can help everybody to, to do the uh, LTPVL in the future. As you can see, we start from the true AP view, so it is IO zero degree, and uh, it is uh, actually rotated, rotated from the TE 90 degree uh, simulation. So that's why uh, if we see a yellow power valve leakage on the right side of the TE 90 degree, it will be actually at the left part of uh, IO zero degree. So you can cross a guy on the left side of the, the tissue valve or a mechanical valve. Then if you see what will be the PVL look on the TEE, it will also on the left part of the TEE show axis around the nine o'clock direction. When we go more IAO, the MPL line, the red MPL line will rotate clockwisely. So if we have uh, IAO 30 degree, it will go from the nine o'clock direction to the 10 o'clock direction. And uh, at this time, the PV arrow will be on the right part of the TEE transgastric 60 degree. We go to the 11 o'clock duration, the IO 60 degree. We go every 30 degree because one o'clock is identical to uh, 30 degree. And uh, the PVL will be on the TEE 30 degree area. And as you can see, if you use the transthoracic show axis to exterminate the uh, PVL preoperatively. You have to keep in mind that the orientation is up, uh, is uh, upside down wh when you use a TEE show axis. Then we go uh, LL. When we go small LL, the MPL line on TEE show axis will go counterclockwisely. So LL 30 degree is uh, identical to the TEE 120 degree, but you need to uh, rotate. So uh, a technique to uh, rotate the TEE is you can flip the TE image t twice. You can do left, right Im mirror image first. There is the button on echo machine, and uh, you can do again the upside down flip by the button of echo machine. So you can actually easily to uh, rotate the TEE into the identical orientation uh, as a fluoroscopy. So let's take a is, uh, look at example. When we examine the power valve leakage after tower, you can see a uh, left PVL on 180 degree. You can see another PVL check on 120 degree. 
but uh, you only see one PVL on shell axis. So actually, how many paraviral leakage does the patient have? With uh, CT help, you can see, you can realize uh, 180 P paraviral leakage on the left part is a green dot here around the 12 o'clock direction. And the 120 PVL on the transgastric left part uh, is around uh, three o'clock, uh, two o'clock direction. So it's actually the, belongs to the same crescent of a PVL. So the patient only have one big crescent shape PVL. So um, my concept today I want to share with uh, our dear friends is we can actually use MDCT as a bridge between three different imaging modalities. We've already known that when we do MPR manipulation, we can have RL, LL, cranial codal angle here. Usually we are uh, at uh, the, uh, some, some corner of your uh, MPR imaging. And uh, we can use uh, CT to simulate the perspective of uh, TEE. So I hope this concept can help heart team members to set up mental co-registration for uh, individual patient. And uh, we can even do a preoperative planning of the tube portation or which TE view should uh, be used for intervention even we, before we put the patient onto the table. So thank you everyone, he, this is my talk. Well, uh, excellent talk. Uh, uh, we thank uh, Dr. Huang Guanzi, who is currently the visiting staff of the echocardio lab of our hospital. Uh, he also do some structure heart uh, intervention. So I think uh, he has a very, uh, very uh, global concept in uh, fusion the all the modalities and uh, get them together and uh, we can have a very very good uh, anatomically uh, configuration in our brain and uh, this can teach the operator to uh, more facilitate uh, the procedure and uh, uh, easily to get the uh, direction of the where the device should be so I think uh, uh, we have a discussion later on, so so we move to the second lecture. The second lecture will be uh, delivered by Dr. Li Yongzai, who is a cardiac surgeon, but uh, is uh, uh, very, uh, I also would say, is a, he is already a renowned uh, interven uh, interventionist uh, in the structural heart disease field. Uh, he is also a proctor of uh, uh, Edwards, Medtronic, and uh, Boston Scientific, and uh, Apopolico devices. And uh, in our team, he is the main person to do uh, CT evaluation uh, pre procedure So I think uh, he got a lot of experience in doing so and uh, can provide a very precise, uh, detailed measurement and uh, recommendation before the procedure. Allow, uh, allowing us to discuss uh, beforehand and uh, make sure that uh, no surprise during the procedure. <laughs> okay, Dr. Lee, uh, please. Yeah. Good morning, uh, everyone. Today, my talk is uh, CT image variation in structural heart disease. And we have some technical issue, but uh, we will fix it uh, immediately. And uh, we know the CT imagery is very important for the structural heart disease. Currently, we almost done everything in multi-size CT and uh, compared to the TE or CTE. And uh, so please, please, the, the slide, we see slide, please.
So the, the structural high intervention is uh, helped by the the CT image, and uh, we can do it uh, from the structural heart. So the connection. Oh, Alex is in uh, sorry, Alex, uh, would you please, please uh, deliver your talk first? Alex? Okay. Can you do that? Oh, uh, we are uh, very happy to have uh, uh, Professor Alex Lee from Hong Kong uh, today join, join this meeting. Uh, Professor Alex Lee is a associate professor of the Department of Medicine and Therapeutics of uh, Chinese uh, University of Hong Kong. He is also the director of uh, echocardiography lab of Prince of uh, Wales Hospital. We know that he is very famous uh, in, 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 in this area and uh, uh, he holds an uh, echo uh, a workshop or a meeting every year and we we all of us uh, have attended the meeting so i think uh, we can learn a lot from him uh, today he's going to talk about echocardiographic evaluation for mitral and the tricuspid valves uh, please uh, uh, professor lee uh, thank you dr in okay so can you see my screen yes please Okay, so um, so I'm given the task to talk about uh, echo evaluation for mitral tricuspid valve, and uh, uh, it's uh, really my pleasure and honor to be here to um, share uh, on this topic with uh, many experts in the field of structural heart intervention and imaging. So I will start with um, the mitral valve. So as we all know, the mitral valve uh, is an interesting structures. It has uh, two leaflet, six segments, and two papillary muscles. And uh, it's um, uh, the surgeon views of the mitral valve uh, typically put the aortic valve at 12 o'clock. And then we have the A1, A2, A3 from the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, lateral to the medial parts of the uh, mitral valve. Now, um, Echo evaluation of the mitral valve starts with uh, the transthoracic echo, and then for further detailed anatomical uh, evaluation, we have the transesophageal echo. The, there are two main types of uh, mitral regurgitation as far as uh, structural interventionists and uh, surgeons are concerned. Um, number one is uh, the degenerative MR. Typically, it's a Carpandia type two. Uh, of MMR, and uh, it's uh, exemplified by the most common etiology is the mitral valve prolapse as a result of degenerative disease. And uh, the second type of uh, MR that we have to deal with uh, interventionally is uh, a functional MR. And uh, functional MR um, is uh, by definition an MR secondary to either the left ventricle or left atrial disease uh, dilatation or dysfunction while the mitral valve itself is intrinsically uh, normal. And the mechanisms of these types of MR is Carpentia type one or type three B. Uh, type one means there is a normal leaflet motion, uh, but mitral annular dilatation. Or type three B means there is restricted uh, leaflet motion uh, as a result of, uh, during systole, as a result of uh, ventricular uh, tethering of the mitral valve. Well, um, the most commonly performed uh, transcatheter mitral valve repair procedure, at least in this part of the world, is the edge-to-edge -edge repair uh, with a mitral clip device. And this uh, procedure works by restoring tissue approximation of a regurgitant leak using a uh, transcatheter delivered uh, clip. Now, um, we need to assess uh, echocardiographically uh, the anatomical feasibility of the um, mitral clip. So typically we need to measure the length of the mitral leaflet, especially the posterior leaflet, because it's usually the shorter leaflet. 
and uh, we need to have adequate length for the mitral clip to be implanted and perhaps on the uh, leaflet uh, tissues. Otherwise, there is a risk of um, uh, single leaflet uh, detachment. And um, when the, uh, the flail gap is also important because if the flail gap between the two leaflets is too big, uh, typically more than 10 millimeter, then uh, it will be difficult to uh, have the uh, clip arms to be able to grasp on both leaflets at the same time, as um, at least using the conventional shorter anti-arc clips, it will uh, have some difficulty. And thirdly, the flare width, which is the width of the prolapse segments or the regurgitant orifice. And uh, the, the bigger this width, the more clip uh, it, may, it may be uh, necessary uh, to control the mitral regurgitation. So we make these measurements preoperatively using transesophageal echo and um, our practice is uh, by default, we implant uh, NTR. Maybe, maybe the speakers and moderator here will have different um, practice, but uh, just want to share our practice. So by default uh, for functional MR, we put an NTR clip at A to P2. Um, we use NTR because uh, in functional MR, usually the flail gap is uh, not a big problem. Uh, the flail gap is usually big only uh, for degenerative MR. And uh, we apply NTR. But uh, if the flail gap is big uh, and there is adequate leaf leaflet length, then we'll consider a uh, clip with the longer arms, which is the XTR. And if the flail width is, is wide and uh, there is adequate uh, mitral orifice area, uh, such that after implanting multiple clips, uh, it is. Uh, less likely that uh, it becomes um, uh, mitral stenosis. And for those patients, we'll, we'll consider applying two clips. And the first clip may be, uh, we intentionally applied it um, uh, not exactly at the middle of the, uh, 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 of the regurgitant lesions, but uh, at a little bit on the side to prepare for the implantation of the second clips. So that's uh, a general approach that we, we, we use. So, the technique to assess the mitral valve uh, for a mitral clip implantation for, or for any interventional procedure has to be systematic. So we have to uh, examine the uh, mitral valve segment by segment uh, using the same angle, using the same views for all patients. So we typically start with a bicommissural view of about 50 to 70 degree at the mid esophageal level. And then we put the next plane um, uh, in the all the three uh, segments at A1, P1, and then A2, P2, and then A3, P3. And on the secondary explain screen, uh, we will be able to see the, uh, the long axis uh, view of the anterior and posterior leaflet at the corresponding uh, segment. Then we can examine uh, very systematically where is the uh, regurgitate regurgitant lesions and where is the prolapse? Is there any calcification? And we measure the leaflet length at exactly where we want to put the clips using this approach. Now for 3D echo, it adds uh, onto the uh, um, uh, tools that we can use to assess the mitral valve anatomy uh, before the mitral clip. So this is a 3D echo data set of the mitral valve and here you see the, the multiplane reconstructed uh, mode showing the uh, bicommissural view, the LVOT view, and also the uh, short axis view of the mitral valve. And you can see here there is a P2 prolapse. And by putting the uh, MPR plane right at the uh, lesions, um, like this, we put the red plane right at the A2P2 segment where there is a prolapse. And on this red plane here, we were able to see the prolapse segment and measure the length of that prolapse segment and also the uh, flail gap. And on the short axis wheel, we'll be able to measure the flail width as, as well. And so using MPR, we would thinly measure the mitral valve area using this uh, mode so that we can adjust the uh, MPR plane, the blue plane to the uh, mitral valve area uh, mitral valve orifice, and then on the blue plane, we will measure the uh, area of the mitral valve orifice. And um, 
the requirement for microclip implantation is more than four centimeters square. Uh, um, in some cases, we may uh, allow the area to be uh, more than 3.5 centimeters square as the uh, threshold for implantation. Now, 3D echo during the implantation is also very important. So typically we go into a 3D mode now uh, during the steering of the mitral clip system because this mode allows us to see the whole mitral valve uh, and the left atrium and also the atrial septum. And we'll see the clip inside the RA and then these uh, interventionists can look at the images and know exactly where they should uh, put uh, 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 what they should do to steer the mitral clip. Now the mitral clip is at the, uh, near the center of the valve, but it is perpendicularity is not correct. Uh, so the interventionists can rotate the CDS uh, such that the clip will become uh, uh, perpendicular to the line of corruptions of the mitral valve. And then the interventionists can also talk the guide and also uh, use the um, uh, the M knob, the A uh, and the uh, L and the and the uh, A knob and P knob, uh, less commonly you should the M knob, um, to uh, and manipulation of the guide to make sure the mitral clip would be um, uh, delivered to the uh, right position of the mitral valve. So all these procedures can be uh, seen very clearly on uh, 3D echo on fast view of the uh, mitral valve. This is an example of a functional MR. This is an atrial functional MR. You see the ventricle is normal in function, but the atrium is big. There is mitral annular dilatation, and there is a severe mitral regurgitation at the A2P2 segment. So uh, this is the implantation uh, of the uh, mitral clip at the A2P2 segment. This is an NTR. We don't use XTR even. The leaflet length is long enough. Uh, we don't need when XTR when it can be used. We only use XTR when it needs to be used. That's our practice because uh, there is always some risk of um, uh, twisting the valve leaflet uh, or entangling the uh, cordae uh, with the XTR. Uh, I think the problem is more uh, is bigger with the XTR than the NTR. The NTR is more forgiving in terms of the uh, twisting of the uh, leaflet. So. If the leaflet gap is not that big, that we usually only use NTR. So we apply the NTR at the A2P2 region and the final result is excellent. You can see a uh, significant reduction of the mitral regurgitation in this patient with atrial functional MR. Now, uh, another patient here is, a, is an example of degenerative MR, a patient with a uh, quite big P2 prolapse with a, a rupture cordy severe MR. The length of the leaflet is 1.3 centimeters and the width is uh, close to 15 millimeter. Uh, but the flail gap was uh, not big and the mitral valve area is more than four centimeters square and there's no calcification. So in this patient, because the flail width is quite big, we decide to uh, implant, uh, we decided that this patient will probably need two clips. And because the mitral valve area is big enough to implant two clips, so we implant our first clip and um, not at the exact center of the P2 uh, segment, but a little bit uh, lateral uh, on the lateral aspect of the P2. So we implant the first clip and this is the LVOT view showing the uh, closure of the grip arm, etc. And then um, this is the, uh, after the first clip, you will see that there is uh, still quite a bit of uh, MR uh, on the medial aspect of the first clip. And this is kind of expected. And the mean gradient is only two. So it allow us to uh, put in the second clip um, to the medial uh, aspect of the first clip. So this is a planned uh, implantation of uh, uh, more than one mitral clip. And this is the uh, implantation of the second clip. You can see the remained uh, prolapse leaflet immediately uh, gone after uh, closure of the uh, clip arm. And then this is the uh, final result showing uh, minimal uh, residual MR with uh, two clips there and then uh, with a successful uh, result. So this is an, an example of um, uh, implantation of uh, mitral clip in a patient with a little bit more complex than the simple uh, uh, patients.
require two clips. And it's quite common now that uh, more than one clip uh, need to be done for some more complex metric completion. Okay, let's talk also about echo cardiography for tricuspid valve. And um, let's uh, revise the tricuspid valve anatomy. And this is the right atrium. This is the I IVC here. And then um, between the IVC and SVC uh, and the tricuspid valve, there is a coronary sinus orifice, which is just adjacent. And this is the uh, atrial septum with the horizontal valley here. And the uh, orifice of the coronary uh, sinus is adjacent to the septal, to the base of the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve. And these are important anatomical landmarks. And this is a tricuspid annulus after the right atrium is removed. And here we got a septal leaflet, which is closest to the ventricular septum and the atrial septum. And then we have the anterior leaflet, which is the biggest uh, tricuspid valve leaflet. And its base is um, uh, sitting on the free wall of the right ventricle. And then we have the posterior leaflet, which is usually the smallest leaflet uh, with the, um, with the uh, base sitting on the diaphragmatic surface of the uh, right ventricle. And here, these are important structures. There's a cordy tendon here. There are quite a lot of uh, cordy tendon in the tricuspid valve, so there is a danger of entanglement uh, with the mitral clip. We have to be very careful, and we have to look for it to avoid our entanglement. And here is an important structure, which is the uh, anterior papillary muscles. Um, uh, there are three papillary muscles in the tricuspid valve, anterior, posterior and uh, septal. And, uh, but uh, only the anterior papillary muscle is always present. The other two may be smaller and or sometimes absent in some patients. And these anterior papillary muscles give cordy to the anterior leaflet and the posterior leaflet, but not the septal leaflet. So it's very important to recognize the presence of the anterior muscles on the echo and um, if it's, um, it's usually arising from the free wall or the moderator band, and uh, it is the only muscles that give rise to cordy to both anterior and posterior leaflet. So if you can identify the papillary muscles on the echo and you can see it's supporting cordy to two leaflets, then that two leaflets will be anterior and posterior leaflet. And this helps us to uh, uh, orient ourselves um, uh, during the echo to see which leaflets is uh, which leaflet, which is important during the uh, tricuspid clip implantation. Now, these are the anterior septal and posterior leaflet, and here is the anterior septal gravitation line, or here is the commissure, and the uh, triclip tri therapy, and mitral clip therapy uh, would be implanted perpendicular to the anterior septal gravitation line, which is here. And during the implantation, here would be the inferior vena cava, and the guide will be going from here, like this direction, and the clip will be implanted here uh, at the end of the septal commissure. So in terms of echo, after we understand the 3D anatomy, then it's easier to under the, understand the different echo view uh, to be used during uh, tricuspid valve evaluation. So this is the echo now 3D showing not from the atrial perspective, but the ventricular perspective. And we have the uh, anterior leaflet here, septal leaflet here, and the posterior leaflet here. And then uh, the 2D echo, uh, typically it's looking at the, uh, the tricuspid valve in uh, several different planes. And these are the uh, pulmonary valve, this aortic valve, and this is where the coronary sinus will be. Now this green plane here will give us a four chamber view and usually we'll be seeing anterior leaflet and septal leaflet, but sometimes if we cut a little bit lower, you will be seeing the posterior leaflet. So you will, can be sure on the four chamber view, whether this leaflet on the lateral side is anterior or posterior. But here, this leaflet attaching to the ventricular septum is always the septal leaflet. So the blue, green, red plane here, uh, if the echo plane is cutting like this, we'll get the RV inflow two chamber view. So in the parasternal RV inflow view, we'll be get something like this. And here we are cutting through the anterior and the posterior uh, leaflet. But if this plane is a little bit uh, tilted this way, then this leaflet here would be septal leaflet. So again, it is difficult to say just by looking at the to the echo. And finally here, this plane here, 
uh, a little bit between the red and the green plane would give us the RV inflow outflow view because we are also now seeing the, uh, the pulmonary uh, valve, the R right ventricular outflow tract here. And this sort of like a parasternal, uh, a short axis view, we'll have the aortic, aortic valve at the middle and we have the RV inflow and outflow. And on this build, we may be cutting the anterior and posterior, but again, if this yellow plane is a little bit tilted towards here, that this leaflet may be septal. So again, it's difficult to tell just on 2D echo. Therefore, 3D echo would be very important for us uh, during the uh, identification of the leaflet. Again, if we do uh, apical views, uh, if we cut the plane here high up, that would get the five chamber view. And then if it's cutting in the middle, then we've got the four chamber view and we don't know this leaf is anterior and posterior or posterior. And if we cut the plane uh, more posterior, uh, when we're seeing the coronary sinus into the view that uh, we are cutting quite low, and then we are knowing that, we know that this probably is the posterior leaf. Now, having said that, these are the, par uh, the uh, TTE view that we can use to assess the tricuspid valve the RV inflow parasternal view. And then here is the uh, parasternal short axis view, or we call it also RV inflow outflow view. And this is the uh, four chamber view. These are the typical views that we, we use. But as I said, it is not easy to determine which leaflets are we seeing at different views. In fact, some, someone done, did a study and to examine the probability of each views showing different kind of combination of the leaflets. And all we got is that we know that uh, there is no 100% certainty here. At any given views, there is only a probability, certain probability that you will be see, able to see a different combination of different kind of leaflets. So on, two chain, on, on the 2D views, uh, uh, uncertainty is the rule. So we need to understand the uh, tricuspid valve using more a 3D perspective. And on TEE, uh, there are several views that will be used uh, to examine the tricuspid valve. First is the, uh, the bicaval view. For the bicaval view, the TEE probe is here, um, and then the plane is uh, cutting across the uh, IVC and the SVC in the right atrial wall like this. We will not see the tricuspid valve on a 2D uh, bicaval view. Like this, we don't see the tricuspid valve. However, if we turn into uh, 3D, um, right at the 2D bicaval view, we'll be gaining a little depth perception and we'll be looking a little bit more into the plane, into the uh, screen, then we'll be starting to see the tricuspid valve. So this 3D plane here is basically just a 3D depth perspective, a live 3D perspective of this uh, bicaval wheel. Uh, we will see the tricuspid valve uh, deep into the uh, screen plane, and it's been useful to help us to orientate ourselves. Another important TE view is to look at the tricuspid valve would be the uh, RV inflow outflow view with, uh, with the probe at the mid esophagus and 45 to 60 degree plane. Here we'll be seeing the, uh, like a short axis view uh, and uh, we will see two leaflets here. And it's very important to get the papillary muscles into the plane because if you can see the anterior papillary muscle, then we'll see the chordae inserting to these two leaflets, then we'll be very sure that these two leaflets is anterior and the posterior leaflet. And an orthogonal plane of this view, 90 degree of this RV inflow alpha view will be a uh, four chamber view of 135 degree, and this view will be cutting the at the anterior and septal leaflet, and in an orientation that is uh, uh, parallel to the mitral clip, I mean perpendicular to the mitral clip implantation. So the mitral clip will be seen implanted best in this view, where we'll be seeing the anterior and the uh, septal leaflet. So this is a very important orthogonal pairs of views that would be used in the triclips. And this is what this looks like in actual TEE. We got this RV inflow outflow view. We see these papillary muscles inserting cordae into both leaflets. So this is anterior leaflet, this is posterior leaflet. And we put the cut plane here, and we'll be see the, seeing the anterior and the septal leaflet on the orthogonal four chamber views. And this would be an ideal view for implantation of the mitral clip. 
Now, sometimes uh, the mid esophageal wheels are not so good at look at the tricuspid valve because in the mid esophageal wheel, the outer side has to pass through the air, it has to pass through the atrial septum, the left atrium, and the mitral valve to go to see the tricuspid valve. Uh, so the outer sign will be accentuated and therefore the image will not be so good sometimes. So the low esophageal comes into a very important uh, role here. In the low esophageal view, there is a window here that uh, the left atrium has already been uh, passed by the probe, but still the right atrium is still in the window. So you can see here, at the lower part here, uh, we can peek into the right atrium uh, directly at the tricuspid valve without intervention of the uh, left atrium or the atrial septum. So the tricuspid valve image would typically would be quite clear here. So in the low esophageal view, if we do an anti-flex, then we're going to see structures more up. Uh, we'll be cutting through the anterior and the septal leaflet. If we do a retroflex here, then uh, the plane will be um, moved down. So in the previous lecture, the speaker have nicely demonstrated the effects of the plane uh, on the plane by the retro and the anti-flex movement. In the retroflex movement, we'll be uh, cutting the plane through the posterior and the septal leaflet. So using these two maneuvers on the low esophageal, we'll be able to see the anteroseptal and the posterior septal uh, preaptation line. And finally, in the uh, transgastric view here, the probe is now in the stomach and the plane is going up like this and in a, about a 51 degree angle uh, then uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the plane, then we'll be able to see the short axis view. And this is the only 2D view that we'll be able to see all three tricuspid valve leaflets in a single plane. And here, this is the septal leaflet, this is the anterior leaflet, and this is the uh, posterior leaflet. And the orthogonal plane of this view will be showing us, uh, we'll be cutting the valve like this, and it will be, we'll be seeing the anterior leaflet and also the posterior leaflet. So in summary, these are the views that will be used in the, during the TAE to examine the uh, tricuspid valve. Of course, there will be uh, uh, 3D views uh, that are also very important because the 3D views allow us to see all three leaflets in, at the same time and we'll be exactly knowing what leaflet are we cutting in the 2D plane, if we apply a, a real-time MPL uh, plane here, and also checking the perpendicularity of the, uh, of the uh, mitra, uh, tricuspid clip. And in the later lecture, we will talk more about uh, uh, the actual procedure of the tricuspid clip. So I think I will stop here. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, finally, I would like to just make an advertisement uh, for Echo Asia 2020, it's now delayed, uh, postponed because of the pandemic to next year, but we'll be uh, holding this uh, conference in Hong Kong next year uh, on May 28th, 30th, uh, 30th May 2021. And I hope that by that time, we'll be able to uh, re resume travel and, and hope that we'll be see you all in Hong Kong uh, in next year meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, excellent talk. I think we can discuss later, and uh, uh, Dr. Lee is ready, so we move on to the next talk. Application of multi slice CT in structure high intervention. Yeah. So as uh, we move, because uh, between the uh, trials, the risk is decreased, uh, such as uh, the top is 2.1, parent 3i is 1.1. So the, we move more and more, younger patient and uh, the risk is decreased. What's happened? Most complications could be avoided before table because the uh, sizing is very important and uh, we know the anatomy and uh, all we know in the CT scan. So we decrease the complication and uh, we can make a good plan by multi-slide CT. And uh, we know the annuals is very important for the, the anchoring the new valve. And uh, here is a very common picture from the, the journal and uh, we can see the cross section of RCC, NCC and the LOCC. And uh, now we call the, the annulus is a virtual ring. It's not the really annulus because uh, you see here the red line is the annulus and uh, we just use the nadir of the valve 
tissue and uh, use its anchor and uh, mar as a mark of the nadir that's anchoring the valve. So we must know the valve structure and uh, then we implant a valve. If we implant too high and uh, partially the valve did not secure by the analysis size, so we need to dip into the LVOT. And uh, if device smaller than annulus, so we got easier embolization, parabolic hitch. If we use a larger device and the rupture of the annulus or perhaps make a will happen in after you put in a device. So size matter and uh, you need a good CT, multi-slice CT and uh, we can make a good measurement and uh, get a good result. So measurement of measuring is very important. Just 20 years ago, and uh, we used the TEE for guidance of the TABI procedure. However, after multi stage CT was introduced to our daily life, and uh, we have a lot of papers say that uh, at least a two millimeter difference between TEE and uh, echocardiography and uh, the multi slice CT. So we need to use the multi slice CT for major the the virtual ring and the during your procedure. So this is a multi slice CT. And uh, now in Chengen Hospital, we ask the technician and the radiologist to acquire whole face CT because whole face CT can give more information such as the systolic information and the diastolic information. Sometimes you cannot get good information from the raw data, so you need to know the, the, the data. And the uh, systolic and the diastolic difference between the U measurement may be as much as 20%. So we need to know the CT is in the systolic phase or at the diastolic phase. So usually I use three mark. The first is the RT valve opening. It should be systolic. And uh, at the same time, you should see the mitral valve opening and the LV muscle contraction. Usually, TAVI device, re re device does recommend major at early systolic. It's uh, phase 30%. I prefer to use N-systolic for larger, large size when you measurement. So it's sometimes a little difference. However, the maximum size is make you success in the, in the TABI procedure when you measure it. So that's a, a little bit difference, maybe one millimeter different than the, the company that taught you the, the different size. And uh, this is very important for VABI more measurement because every different valve have different labeling and uh, different ID. So we need to check the VIB the valve. And uh, sometimes metallic ring represent showing ring. That's not because the uh, booming effect will have some effect on your real size. So we Sometimes we just check the inner surface and uh, it's about two millimeter below the metallic rim. And uh, the ID should be the inner surface of the metallic rim, but the measurement should not start from the metallic rim. And uh, you should check that uh, if possible, make the rim more circular. And uh, this is an uh, example for double valve replacement during power TABI procedure and uh, the parameter is very important for the RT valve and the ID is 17.5. And then you need to know the original operation now. However, in some patient, they just refer for the surgery and uh, they sometimes they come here for overseas surgery. So they, we need to check the pyramid, the, the inner diameter and the uh, compared to the pharmaceutical recommendation and you jury you can get a good good correlation from the, the suggestion. And uh, you need to know the neo LVOT. The neo LVOT you measure start from the RT bubble coplanar view and uh, dip into the LVOT. 
and uh, you can see the chart just uh, in front of you. So you now you can imagine that you see from the RT bulb to the LOB, and uh, you can get a bulb area, and the nadir is a uh, showing rim, and the uppermost point is a uh, neo LOB OT. When you implant a bulb in bulb in micro position, it's very important. Especially for paramount the bovine bulb, it's we all abstract uh, your all L new LVOT and uh, leave uh, only s very small space, and uh, this space should not less than one hundred, and uh, sometimes uh, you need one hundred and thirty millimeter per square meter, and uh, this in this case uh, neo LVOT is one hundred and sixty nine. And the, the the narrowest point is at the 40 millimeter line below the RT bulb. Then the, the process of micro ID is 25. So that's a uh, compared to the original application, no, it's quite consistent. And the uh, failed prosthetic RT bulb and the micro bulb, the uh, operation no, is uh, 21 and 27. So we, our measurement is the ID is correct correlation well, so we can do a good implantation and uh, as a micro function because, because the the RT bulb usually 21 or or 19, so that uh, we use a transmimal procedure but not a trans micro and a trans apical aortic. And uh, we can get a quiz result from the TE view. And uh, now we use the Philip Petrol view to evaluate the, the real LVOT. So you can imagine you see from the, the left bench call and uh, a narrow space just here. You can see the, the muscle is here and uh, it's very close to the, the your new bulb. And uh, this is a post sign bulb, so upper skirt is uh, uh, leave a, a space so we, we can make sure that the uh, LVOT areas was not quite severe in this case. This is the, the minimum requirement of neo LVOT is about 120. And uh, you need to know the corner high and the stationary for the, the bar in bar procedure. And uh, when uh, you can see the transaction of the bilateral coronary artery, and uh, you can know when you open the the valve, the neo sinus can have leave a space. And uh, now the data show at least uh, two to four millimeter is minimal requirement of the your new neo sinus. And I will show here another procedure. It's a uh, seventy years. Eight years old the male, and uh, he received KVG before, and uh, because this is a uh, true by classify, and uh, we do some measurement because the uh, LVOT classification. So the first time we did a, a procedure that's a tabby procedure, and uh, you can see here the calcium was black uh, here, and uh, that we cannot. It spend more, so it leave a lot of my paraviral leakage in the first procedure, and uh, then the patient got heart failure. So we check the multi slide CT again, and uh, you can see here is a huge case case in prevent you expand further, and uh, the valve opening is circular, and uh, we the next plan is uh, we need to do a paraviral leakage occluder. So as uh, you can see here, uh, two measurement of the the uh, the parallelic kitchen. So we can need to do these two parallelic kitchen. Then it's compared to the the TEE measurement. It's just very correlated, and uh, you know the CT scan is like a CAT scan is like a surgical view, and uh, the the TEE just. Uh, uh, mirror image of your CT scan. So you, when you use the term, you should compare to the your echocardiography. That's uh, you say the same direction. And after the the occult, here you can see we do the the two occult, and uh, it's quite uh, quite good 
after a quarter, and uh, this is the first, and uh, the second is here, is uh, the cutting is not quite clear. And so as, uh, the, when you need to check the, the occurred uh, parabolic and uh, you is very important. And uh, another application of the tricuspid implantation and the pulmonary intervention, because the tricuspid valve is the uh, opening, the, when we implant uh, the, the tricuspid valve, we usually use the, the open ring. And uh, sometimes uh, the open ring, ring is a uh, is a uh, not perpendicular so when you slight angle the the the, the cutting cutting plane the area change quite much so we need to know the 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 real physiology and the exercise and uh, need to uh, simulate when in virtually and uh, when tricuspid procedure you need to know the IVC to RV angle and uh, in this case, it's 55 degree, and the uh, RBC rotate to RB is 111. It's 10 is a uh, 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 limit of the your your retroflex caster when you do a, a stepping bump. And uh, if you use the uh, SVC RB2 apex is 150, and uh, RBC need SVC need need to rotate to RV78. So it's uh, very important when you plan. It says SVC OK or IVC OK, so that uh, we use the IVC for this case. And uh, it's just about the same. And at the same time, you can plan your wire to the apex or to the, the pulmonary vein. In this case, the pulmonary layer was not enough space for apex, so we just uh, insert the apex the wire to the apex. And uh, for pulmonary vein, it's more difficult because uh, the pulmonary is cannot see by TEE. So the multi-size CT can help you measure the pulmonary valve. And uh, here is a valve in valve for, for pulmonary valve. And uh, you can see here that the TEE cannot see anything and uh, we can use the pulmonary valve. And, uh, we done very good, and uh, the uh, and the next example is uh, when you use CT, and uh, you can see the tortures of aorta, and uh, make you a good plan. In this case, it's two tortures, so that uh, we do a table and uh, double lung tuck pressure for pass through the wire, and uh, some communication here, the rupture aorta, and uh, we do a T bar for your plan, and uh, you need to know the uh, mobile classification at the distal RT arch. And uh, here we can see by T and the T and the multi slide CT. And uh, eventually the, the distal M4 to SMA and uh, receive the, the, the small bowel resection. So my comment is uh, multi slide CT with EKG getting is very important in structural heart intervention planning and uh, it improve our daily life. And uh, we need to know the physiology and anatomy of heart structure. So you can do a very good planning in your structural heart intervention. And uh, with the TEE guide, and uh, we have a great result for our cases. Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, all the lecture have been delivered on time, so we we have uh, plenty of time to discuss. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Xu Rongchen from Far East Memorial Hospital, uh, who is currently the Secretary General of the Taiwan Society of Cardiovascular Intervention, and uh, he is also the Chief of the Castlev of uh, Far East Memorial Hospital, Tai Taipei, Taiwan, and uh, we also have. Uh, Casey Lee, uh, Li Guozhen is uh, from our hospital. He is also a cardiac surgeon, uh, actively involve our heart team for structural heart intervention. So uh, I would like to ask the panelist, uh, do you have any comments or questions for, for the lectures? I have a question uh, for uh, Dr. Huang. Uh, 
I really enjoyed your uh, lecture on the, um, the co-registration between the uh, TEE and also the CT. Uh, is really very useful and practical. Um, one question is, uh, is there, how can you translate the, um, the uh, angle of the, of the uh, fluoroscopy from the um, TEE uh, short axis view uh, where you can see the uh, uh, aortic valve and the parasonal leak uh, you know, on the on the TE short axis view, you can see the paravalvular leak at zero degree, at uh, zero o'clock. I mean, twelve o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, etc. Right. So, so we can see the paravalvular leak location uh, very clearly on TE. We usually use that view rather than using the deep transcatheter view as the um, as the most common view to use to assess the location of the uh, uh, paravalvular leak. So, can can we translate? the location of the leak on the short axis view of TEE to the fluoroscopic angle. I think this would be very uh, uh, useful if we can do that. There's a, like the formula that you use, a direct translation into a, uh, from the short axis view to a uh, fluoroscopic angle. Do you, do you have a, such an experience or uh, what's your thought on that? Yeah, uh, I, I think the, uh, Dr. Lee has a very important question because uh, sometimes some sonographer will directly translate the uh, direction on the shark view of the T directly to compare the to uh, angiography, but uh, um, it's kind of uh, complex because it's uh, it's about the uh, how many degree your uh, iota uh, deviated. If uh, your out, uh, ascending aorta is uh, right, quite straight, it will uh, it sometimes become possible to directly translate the uh, uh, PVL location from the shear view. <coughs> but uh, if your ascending aorta is uh, kind of torturous, and that, uh, which means is there is a big degree of the ascending aorta, just like the degree we measured before Taver. Uh, the short view orientation will be distorted. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, um, an important method is to use the direction of uh, inter-atrial septum as a landmark. But if the patient has uh, uh, extremely large right atrium or extremely large left atrium, the direction of uh, inter-atrial septum will also distort it, just like what happened when we do uh, transeptal puncture at some uh, uh, EP procedure when the patient have uh, uh, disproportionate left and the atrial, left and the right atrial size, uh, it will become very difficult to do a transeptal puncture. So I think uh, Dr. Lee has a very uh, important question. Uh, a tip is about how to uh, identify the location of uh, interatrial septum. So, uh, as many sonographer will, uh, sonographer will notice this equation is sometimes your shark's view is uh, uh, generated at uh, TEE around 40 to 50 degree. But sometimes the show axis view can be generated at TEE 90 degree. When the degree is larger, which means your ascending aorta is more to is more distorted. So, if your shortest view is generated at not at common uh, angle of the TE uh, rotation, you cannot direct translate the uh, direction of uh, shortest view to do the procedure. But if your choice is, is generated at a common degree of the TE rotation, probably you can uh, some, somehow translate the uh, P PVL location directly to the uh, angel degree. Uh, because uh, we have to say even at uh, 2 o'clock di distance, they are only 60 degrees. Uh, difference on the angiography. 
because uh, sometimes the uh, as, unless the PVL is very small, you can expand from only one crack area. Or if the P PVL is big, it sometimes at least expand from, uh, for example, from uh, one uh, 12 o'clock to three o'clock. So you, you have a plen plenty uh, space for your uh, angel tube to rotate because there will be a 90 degree tolerance. So it depends how big the PVL, how, how, uh, how big, how wide the PVL is. If the, you have a wide PVL, you have a more space to tolerate the difference of the IL area on your angel of tube. But if you, uh, you have multiple tiny PVL, you cannot direct translate the show axis uh, direction on your angiography. Thank you. But I think uh, I, you're right. Uh, we cannot directly translate the echo view during the procedure into a fluoroscopy. But as you show that on the preoperatively, uh, you know the on the CT because you know the location of the esophagus that you know the orientation of, of the heart relative to the esophagus. And I think you can, and also if you do the TE, you know uh, where is the uh, paravalve leak, um, and uh, you may superimpose that information onto the CT. If the CT cannot, <clears throat> cannot show clearly where the dehiscence, as you said, the CT cannot show clearly the, the, uh, the leak, but sometimes show the dehiscence. But if it does not show the dehiscence on the TEE, you see the leak, you will, you will know where the leak is relative to the maybe the uh, uh, the, the atrial septum, and then to, you on the CT you know the orientation of the of the atrial septum and the leak relative to the esophagus, and then I think you can then work out the plane, the fluoroscopy plane that you need uh, during the the, the cath lab procedure. Sure, sure. It can be done because just as what I demonstrated uh, in my speech, I, you, I actually can use MDCT to co-register the location of a transcatcher and the show axis view. So once you have a nice show axis, view, show axis echo view, you, you know where the uh, leakage is uh, in relation to atrial septum or coronary ostium or left appendage. You can find the show axis anatomy details on MDCT, and you can do the same thing. You can co register the show axis view onto the simulated transgastric TE views on MDCT. And uh, because the transgastric MDCT simulation generates a, a more feasible angiography degree, so you can apply the LL IO cranial codal from the simulated uh, TE imaging on MDCT, which means the gantry position. So you have the gantry position, you can easily uh, do the PVL treatment. Thank you. Thank you, it's very useful. Let, let me explain more about uh, the, the multi style CT and the, the TE. And uh, in coplanar view, that's a uh, every Implanter should know the coplanar view is projection from the the proloscopy, and you can find the coplanar view from your multi style CT. And uh, from this method, uh, you can get a projection for um, you. Most software you can have a uh, LOI or RAO or the the mm -hmm. cranial caudal from your multi style CT projection. And uh, it uh, may be some difference, but it can indicate uh, your best projection of your your paralytic location. And uh, and uh, by assisting the real time TE, and uh, you can get a good information the location of the paralytic. Sometimes uh, the leakage have two or three, and uh, if you do not have a good pre plan CT or TE. And uh, you just uh, up up the the wrong wrong paralytic is the uh, the patient may need another procedure for the occult. So may I ask a question uh, for Doctor Please Huang? open your microphone. 
Dr. Xu. Uh, I have open my question. Uh, open we, my can, we can hear you. Xu Hongchen, open the microphone. I open it. Oh, now it's okay. Now it's okay. Now it's okay. Professor Yin and the uh, organizing committee, uh, thanks to uh, invite me to join this session and to learn uh, a lot from three speakers. And uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Huang have uh, demonstrated a good uh, correlation uh, between the uh, T transubacular echo and the multi slide CT and the fluoroscope. And uh, uh, from the multi slide CT, you can see the angle, just like the, uh, Dr. Li Yongzai's comment. And I, I have uh, just one disagreement that uh, I, I think it's useful to use the uh, echo navigator like the fusion imaging uh, to treat the parabolic leak. Because from the intraoperative transesophageal echo, you can uh, label the uh, parabolic leak uh, using the virtual uh, dot on the screen. And you can do the rotational angle and you can uh, just show the, uh, to find a most practical view to uh, accrue the parabolic leak. And uh, from, uh, uh, Alex Lee, I, I think I have been attend your workshop before, and I learned uh, really uh, much, and it's very informative, and especially for the tricuspid ball. And uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Li Yongzai, uh, and uh, many interesting cases and educational cases. And uh, I think uh, uh, from the multi slide CT, if we can use the uh, uh, multi phase reconstruction, like the uh, like from the ECG tracing, we can reconstruct 20%, 30%, 70%, 80%, and we can uh, measure the largest annulus, then we can uh, avoid the, the annulus rupture. That is the catastrophic complication. So, um, uh, Dr. Wang, may I ask a uh, question about the, uh, because we have uh, lots of uh, positive valve, uh, like the McTardy valve, some uh, tissue valve, and uh, we also have a new generation of uh, such as the suture disc valve and the rapid deployed valve. So, you know, the surgeon uh, afraid about the parabolic, especially when the heart beat again, and we find there is a parabolic over there. So, could you uh, point the, the, the exact point of the leak for us, uh, in, in especially in new generation valve, I say the rapid, rapid deployed valve or suture disc valve? Because uh, once there is uh, some significant power leak, maybe we don't have to expand the valve and the, uh, and, and the shift to the traditional uh, suture valve because uh, they take lots of time and they cost lots of money of the patient. So maybe uh, if you can point which one is the, uh, the, the leak sign, then we made one or two stitch, maybe from outside the outer to the uh, serene rain, then can, we can solve the problem. So how about your experience? Because uh, you do lots of effort and uh, helped us to identify all the surgical results quite well. So from your experience, if there is a different process, uh, is, there any, is there any problem um, or, or you can identify the uh, parabolic for us, then we can uh, use a very simple method to deal with the problem. Thank you. I think uh, uh, we need to uh, discuss with the surgeon uh, directly and uh, frequently because uh, where the power, where is the power valve leakage is actually dependent on where the suture is. So if we know what happened during the very first time valvular replacement surgery, Sometimes the surgeon will tell me, oh, I, I probably, the, the I'm not quite sure with the, the suture at the, which direction. But we can investigate that part more uh, detail uh, with different techniques such as the true view uh, introduced by Professor Alex Lee and uh, YT Lee. Because uh, we... For the evaluation of the uh, power valve leakage, sometimes we can be confused by the dropout artifact. So if you, we know where, uh, what happened during the very first surgery, we can uh, more 
more com com confident about the what where the lesion is. And uh, one of my suggestions is uh, sometimes when we talk about the duration of uh, PVL, we will uh, use to use the um, location of the clock. But sometimes my three o'clock is not the same duration of the surgeon's three o'clock. So I will suggest to use the anatomy landmark when we uh, discuss the direction of the uh, power valve leakage. And I uh, have some uh, response to uh, my, my Xue Zhang, Dr. Xu Yongchen. Uh, I, I actually quite uh, confirm the, uh, the uh, utility about the fusion imaging, but uh, actually some beginner is actually an echo navigator need learning curve. And actually my comment is we have to, uh, when we use the echo navigation, the fusion imaging, we cannot use the traditional the direction of the angiography tube. Actually, we have to adjust the angiography tube. Then we can have a white whale spread echo imaging on the fusion imaging. Then we can have the information of the echo imaging. If the echo imaging is distorted and uh, shrink uh, skewed on the fusion uh, imaging. Actually, you don't have some the information from echo. You just have to to distort your sector, the red sector, the green sector, and uh, you have nothing inside. But if you adjust the angiographic tube to a, a nice direction to spread out the, the echo, then you can have the information. So uh, I, I did not to uh, uh, say that echo navigation is not useful, but uh, you have to be familiar with this technique. Then you can have the advantage of this technique. Thank you. And I have one question for Dr. Li Yong uh, Would you uh, uh, can you measure the near LBOT uh, before the uh, like the uh, mitral valve involved, and uh, if uh, the, if your calculation, uh, the near LVOT will less than 120, as you said, uh, what's your next plan? It, the near LVOT is very important in mitral procedure. In the future, we will have the transcase mitral valve replacement. And uh, if we do, we do mitral valve in rim, and uh, you need to know the near LVOT. So by this method, uh, I think we did not check every case because we did not have a lot of information. And uh, a paper just published by Vinny recently, they, they calculated and correlated the post-procedure post pressure graded. They say that uh, around 120 millimeters square is the low limit. However, a lot of device uh, in mitral valve, such as uh, you maybe use the perimon, you maybe use the, the postline valve, and uh, the postline valve, when you open in the, the stepping valve, the, the upper skirt it was not obstructed by the valve tissue. So the uh, neo LVOT seems like the smaller, but you still can do it. And uh, when when you when you you measure the LVOT and uh, sometimes you can see the short just at the septum, and uh, sometimes we just double the procedure because the neo LVOT is a uh, quite catastrophic result when you have a LVOT pressure gradient even as a uh, totally occurred. A lot of report from the internet, and uh, and uh, we we talk to the a pioneer of the vitro valve valve. They say that uh, you if you t if you have the LVOT obstruction, the patient sometimes never rescued by procedure. So that's a, it is very important, and you and uh, you need to check the neo LVOT in every case. So, so Dr. Li. Because uh, when we do the TAVA, we will talk about the EOA index. 
So do you think that in the near future we have the new neo LVOT index uh, for for some uh, big big patient and the small body patient? I mean. Yeah, really, I don't know because uh, after mitral procedure, especially for mitral stenosis, and uh, the the left ventricle will become larger, and uh, during the mitral procedure, that's uh, such as uh, prosthetic mitral stenosis, the patient was quite dry and dehydrated. So during the procedure, you must uh, ask uh, an anesthetist uh, give the word worried and the after procedure the left ventricle will become larger and uh, you can see every time when we tighten down the apex suture that uh, the LV become larger and uh, become the, the 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 tension of the LV was not quite quite severe so that uh, we can feel that. So it's a dynamic dynamic situation. So neo LVOT is uh, when the LV is larger and uh, you can say it's safe. And uh, another problem is uh, the auto mitral angle. Usually the surgeon do not hope to implant above just obstruct the LVOT. However, especially in small AD and the mitral stenosis and uh, the hypertrophy left ventricles so when we implant the the, the bulb, we the surgeon should rotate maybe 10 degree or 15 degree to prevent the the LVOT obstruction. So as a as a as a my courage the the person he does a when I begin the mitral valve suture he said that you must uh, end the the middle part of lois uh, in the middle of the LVOT. So as a uh, when the upper throat won't obstruct the the RT valve. So it's an idea, and the surgeon should know how to prevent the LVOT obstruction in the future. Yeah, may I ask a question uh, for Professor Alex uh, Lee? And uh, regarding the clipping for, for, for functional MR, when there is a big in, in, uh, incomplete cooptation, uh, where will you start? If you uh, plan to do two or three clips, uh, then start from the edge or start from the center. Because uh, to our experience, there is sometimes to hold the biggest uh, incomplete closure will make tension on the leaflet and even tear the leaflet longitudinally. So would that be good to, uh, better to, to, to clip from the edge and then the center of the, the, the leaks? Uh, the other question is, uh, if the leaks is uh, eccentric, uh, where do you start? Uh, can you answer that? Okay, so um, the first question is, when there is a big flail gap, uh, would we consider uh, applying the clip at the gap or uh, adjacent to it, like a zipping technique? So um, we, I myself seldom have the experience of the zipping technique, although we sometimes use it when there really we cannot apply the clip at the uh, flare segment. Uh, but uh, because we now have the XTR with a longer arm, so uh, it reduced the uh, necessity for us to use like this a zipping technique because even with the flare gap of uh, quite significant flare gap, but we can still uh, able to grasp it using the XTR. So in terms of the tension, I think, uh, I, of course, I don't know for sure, but I think if the leaflet length is long enough for the, the, for the uh, clip to grasp on, then the, uh, uh, the flail gap itself is not too much a problem regarding the tension after applying the clip, as long as there is sufficient leaflet length. Because usually it's a tear is that your clip, your leaflet length is not long enough and the clip is only grasping a very short segment of the leaflet, then, then there's a chance that the tension may tear the, uh, the clip. And this happened before in our experience too. But if there's adequate length, usually it's not a problem. So for those with a big flow gap, we would choose to use XTR. If even the XTR cannot grasp it, then uh, we have experienced some experience of grasping on the adjacent side uh, so, to, so that to close the uh, flow gap a little bit 
by applying it in the JSON clip, and 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 it's also sometimes work. But uh, I think those cases are really not good case for mitral clip, and we we would uh, consider surgery uh, probably. Okay, thank you. So, sorry, um, <clears throat> one quick. Oh, okay, sorry. yeah, you over. Uh, Alex, uh, because uh, we do more and more uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in uh, recent months uh, at our center. So basically, uh, since you are the expert of the echocardiogram, you, you always talk about the display, cold day. So how about the myocardium and the puppy muscle? Because uh, we want to cut the muscle as much as possible, but preserve the mitral valve uh, for the patient as possible as we can. So how about the, the, the role of uh, TE in the operation of uh, uh, myotomy for the patient with uh, obstructive or non-obstructive the cardiomyopathy? Oh, sorry, I don't quite understand your question. You are asking about the myectomy for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Yes, and uh, some, some patients have the uh, mild to moderate the uh, mitral regurgitation. So ah. sometimes we have to cut enough muscle, but have to preserve the, the base of the puppy muscle. So ah. how about the, the, the role of uh, echocardiogram in, 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 in providing the information to the surgeon, which parts or which one we should cut more or which one we should preserve. Uh, uh, I, I think it's very important for a surgeon because uh, currently we based on the information of MI or some, uh, yes, some, some, some uh, echo uh, information uh, during operation. Same but uh, uh, yeah, that, okay. that's my so question. Yeah. We, we do interrupt TE for the surgeon and we, on the LV OT view, where you can see the septum and also the SAM, the SAM, the systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. And then you see where is the, uh, the where the uh, mitral valve tip touch at the ventricular septum during systolic anterior motion on that view. And if you turn on the color, you will see a accelerated uh, Doppler flow right at the uh, maximum obstruction site, uh, uh, hemodynamically most significant obstruction site with the brightest color and most uh, uh, um, um, turbulent flow. So that is the site of the most critical uh, LVO2 obstruction. And that's where we advise the surgeon to uh, put their knives to cut the, the, the septum, uh, remove the muscles there. And, uh, and in terms of how much muscle to remove, then uh, we will, uh, again, we use the uh, 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 TEE to show them uh, uh, how much septum they can be removed without, uh, you know, uh, much uh, chance of uh, creating a ventricular septal uh, uh, defect there. So, so we measure the uh, thickness of the septum, and then we also measure the uh, the depth of the, uh, uh, the muscles that need to be removed in order to uh, open up the LVOT obstruction. Of course, it's only an estimate. It cannot be sure because the hemodynamic consequence of cutting how much your muscle is always uh, an estimation. So uh, it's, a, it's just we just want them not to cut too much to uh, you know uh, create a VSD, and then uh, that that's uh, I think I, that's what we do in the TE. And, and we don't, we usually, the surgeons stay away from the uh, papillary muscles because the papillary muscle, I think you must know that it is not arising from the septum. It's arising from the, uh, the, the, the free wall or the lateral wall um, of the ventricle. And, the, and therefore, they usually they will avo avoid the cutting the, the septum and or the in pure myectomy uh, situation. Okay, thank you. Uh, could I ask another question about the tricardi valve? So mm -hmm. in mitral valve, we have we can classify uh, there is the primary or secondary uh, uh, MR. So how about in tricardi valve? Can we uh, uh, have uh, 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 very clarified uh, uh, to uh, which one is the primary TR or which one is the secondary uh, TR? And uh, uh, could you provide uh, some information for a surgeon which size of the uh, tricardial valve range we should adapt uh, during our uh, tricardial repair? Right. So um, 
most of the TR we now see clinically are functional TR, 90% are functional TR, and 10% are primary TR, and usually now is related to uh, maybe device, uh, the pacemaker lead or ICD leads, or maybe a, a previous biopsy causing uh, trauma, I mean endocardial frequent and myocardial biopsy causing trauma, and, and also maybe uh, endocarditis, sometimes traumatic TR. So these are the uh, rare causes of TR now, near less than 10% of cases uh, are, are primary. And we can see that very uh, clearly on echo. On echo, uh, for traumatic TR, we will see uh, sometimes a prolapse or flail leaflet. And if it's a pacemaker, we can actually uh, see the uh, site, the location of the pacemaker lead, whether it is passing through the center of the orifice, which is okay, or if it's passing through the uh, leaflet or in interfering with the leaflet motion and therefore causing the TR, and they all can be seen on echo, especially with 3D echo. So echo can tell the surgeon where, what is the etiology of the TR, whether it's a secondary or primary. And also we can estimate the pulmonary pre systolic pressure, and because uh, some uh, functional TR are secondary to pulmonary hypertension, which can be secondary to left side disease, or it can be uh, 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 just uh, uh, primary pulmonary hypertension, and we can measure the pulmonary pressure. And some patients have uh, atrial fibrillation and annular dilatation and causing the functional TR without much uh, pulmonary hypertension. Again, we can also uh, uh, characterize those cases. And we can measure the tricuspid valve annulus in several ways. Usually, uh, we use, um, or, or traditionally, we use the four-chamber view and at diastole and measure the septal uh, and, and the, the dimension at the septal and lateral uh, tricuspid annulus. And we, in, in literature, we, or in the guidelines, we use four centimeters uh, as a cut point. If it's more than four centimeters, it's dilated and uh, a tricuspid annuloplasty during a, 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 a left heart surgery procedure is, rec is recommended. So the surgeon should probably also uh, put in a ring in a dilated tricuspid annulus when they're doing a mitral valve surgery or ill valve surgery, for example. Even the MR is only mild or even absent. So we use the four-chamber view. But I think more and more uh, evidence shows that actually uh, the four-chamber view may not give us the maximal diameter because the tricuspid uh, orifice, uh, because in the four-chamber view, you, it's difficult for us to know whether we are used to cutting the plane at the maximal diameters of the tricuspid valve. So I think 3D echo is now increasingly being used. Uh, the threshold uh, we now use is still the four centimeter threshold on 3D echo uh, to advise the surgeon because we know we don't have better value just for 3D echo and we think we need a more uh, 3D echo study to tell us what is the uh, threshold dimension of annular dilatation on 3D echo probably more than four centimeters. Uh, but uh, that's what we use now uh, uh, practically. Thank you. Well, any other question or comment? No? Well, actually, we have an extensive uh, and a wonderful discussion. Uh, almost cover every issue uh, should be discussed in this session. So I really appreciate your attention and, uh, and your contribution to this meeting. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Joko Wang. Uh, along with me is uh, Professor Lee and Professor Chao. So I am going to start the first presentation. I'm going to present transcaster proof of replacement in Taiwan. I'm from uh, National Taiwan University Hospital. Uh, I will now talk about the uh, why we need a pool valve replacement, who, when, how, above, current status in Taiwan. And as we know that, uh, like a uh, tetralifalot, uh, after repair, many develop pool valve regurgitation because the, the initial pool valve annulus is small and the uh, uh, surgeon has to enlarge the pool are the so-called right ventricle alpha trap RVOT and cause pool valve regurg. And pool valve regurg is usually well tolerated in the first decade of life. But uh, progressive, the uh, RV dilatation may develop. And finally, uh, RV may uh, have increased uh, compliance and regurgitation. This is a vicious cycle. We have to break this vicious cycle before the RV deteriorated. So this, like this one, and, and the valve <coughs> replacement should be performed before it reversible RV uh, dysfunction. So especially in oriental country, transannual parts is, of the RVOT is usually uh, applied in patient uh, after trial follow surgery. And uh, this RVOT patch may cause severe PR in the long run. Uh, around this an estimate 30% at 20 year follow up may need uh, pool valve replacement. And uh, pool valve severity increase with age. And as uh, we know, PR is not a benign lesion because of heart failure may occur. And also arrhythmia and sudden cardiac death is uh, with a tetrafolol patient after repair is of, often associated severe PR. So we have to uh, fix the PR. So this is the survival curve of tetrafolol repair. And uh, we know many of them will die uh, after repair of uh, heart failure and uh, arrhythmia. So uh, we have to treat the PR but uh, we know uh, 15 to 30 per percent of patients with repaired tetraphalot. And uh, the goal of the valve replacement is to improve functional class and quality of life and maintenance of RV function and uh, decrease the risk of arrhythmia and sadicata death. So who needs poor valve replacement? As we know that tetraphalot patient, 30 percent, lost procedure with PR, and Ross procedure is for LT valve stenosis, and we uh, uh, rotate the, uh, the, the pool valve to the LT position, and so the bad uh, LT valve is transferred is to the pool position, so PR will occur in the long run. And some congenital heart is such a critical pool valve stenosis, so Poor atresia intact septum, those will be have a PR and truncus arteriosus. So this is an example of severe PR. So we have to when consideration. The timing is very important. Uh, we should not uh, perform pumbal repression too late, and also not too early, because too late will uh, have patient will have. Uh, the RV deterioration and too early maybe uh, patient may need uh, one or two more replacement in his life. So we have to watch the balance between benefit and disadvantage. And surgery is a good option, but uh, now we have this technique. Should we need surgery? But still we need surgery Some in some patient. Maybe <clears throat> in 30% of our series, we, we uh, we need surgery because the RVOT is too large. And uh, <clears throat> when we consider 
the valve, what kind of valve, which valve, what size. And this is the before development of reversible, irreversible RV dysfunction. And the, the, so the indication now is well accepted. If RV and diastolic volume in, index more than 150 or 160, RV and systolic volume more than 75 or 80 cc per square meter, or presence is significant PR is PR fraction is more than 30 percent. And sometimes RBOT, the pressure gradient more than 50, uh, we have to use the, the so-called melody valve. And RV dysfunction, ejection fresh more less than 40 percent and associated with symptoms. And how we uh, assess the, the, the RVOT function, we have to do the MRI to determine RV function, PR fraction, RV size, and RVOT morphology, and do the CAD cast to do the balloon sizing, and uh, to test occlusion to check coronary artery compression, and this MRI, and uh, we we rely on MRI to to check the, the RV function, also the PR fraction. And you know, uh, aviotic morphology may change, uh, maybe a, a lot of type, they are now five types. So the, some morphology is, is not good for the uh, uh, transcaster profile replacement, like a reverse pyramidal shape, like a type three. And most common is type one, like this one and we test the coronary artery, and we will do balloon sizing to measure the, 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 the annulus, and also to make an angel during balloon inflation. This is too big for the current technique. And this is coronary artery compression test. We use, uh, sometimes we have to, we use uh, the coronary artery, uh, the, the angiography selective to test whether there is compression or not. And uh, in the market, there are uh, several valves available now. Many valve has been available in the United States for a decade, and Sapien valve, there are a lot of report. And harmonic valve still in clinical trial, and pasta valve, this valve is from, from Korea. But uh, sometimes we use handmade valve if the patient cannot afford the price. The surgeon will make a valve for the patient. And Venus P valve is from mainly China. We have uh, involved in the clinical trial. And we have to match the valve to RV OT morphology and size, like uh, this panther wedge in uh, wood, and like this, the, the valve is in this position. And we have balloon expandable valve and self expandable valve. And these are the melody, sapien, and this uh, so called the, uh, the, 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 the valve in, is still on, on the pipeline. And this uh, valve is Venus P. And melody, sapien, there's balloon expandable up to 29, up to 22. And Venus P valve can use patient up to 22 millimeter, and pasta valve can use up to 30. So, can, and it lives after expanded, maybe measure the diameter to 32. So the mandit valve is the first valve we use before, and uh, this can should be crimped in the delivery system. And the contraindication is the RVOT size too small, or RVOT size too large, and um, coronary artery compression is contraindication, and body weight has to be uh, more than 30 kilo. This is an example in the case of compressed heart. We stent in first, then advance the, the valve. Then uh, we call it B, B balloon, BIB, in the, uh, inflate the small uh, inner balloon, then inflate the outer balloon. This balloon is very good for the, uh, the valve implantation. And after that, no, no regurgitation. Okay. In this case, with tetrafalo after repair, you can see there's stenosis here and annular here. And we stent it and put, 
put a valve in. This is the before and after. And in this case, we have a genesis stand in RVOT conduit. We can see the, the, the genesis here. So we break the genesis stand, it was an Atlas balloon. Then break it more. And after that, we implant the valve. And this is the final, there's no PR at all. And however, we have some complications, such as stand migration. You see this one? Uh, this, the annuals measure more than 22, and uh, we stand it. But unfortunately, during uh, inflation, the stand migrated. So we had to put another second stand in. And, and totally three stands, and you can see that, but fortunately they're, they're open cell, no uh, compression of the uh, LPA. And uh, this is a statistic from the United States, uh, the uh, their freedom from death and freedom from experimentation and freedom from reintervention. The majority of Intervention, re-intervention is the problem of stem fracture. And finally, uh, they realized that uh, pre-stenting is very important. This is the early stage of melody valve. And some complication has been reported, and Edward Sapien valve still have the similar, the, the balloon expandable valve, and can be used in uh, larger RBOT and stand dislocation, valve dislocation, device malformation, arrhythmia, valve thrombosis, parabolic, and you see the stem fracture here. And one important thing is that the endocarditis occur in one to 2.4% per patient year. That's been reported in Jack. And um, also, we now we realize that the pre-standing is required for medic valve, but uh, this optional for saving valve, and sometimes they recommend the multiple stent, more than one stent. So, medic valve, uh, although it was well accepted, but uh, there's still some limitation in that the, the annual size in more than 22 is not uh, allowed to use a melody valve. And if there is conduit, RVOT conduit, or some kind of so-called Rastelli procedure is preferred. And so-called native RVOT, because uh, sometimes landing zone is difficult to find. So no good landing zone. Sometimes we do not uh, use a melody valve for this case. And another is limitation is, is more expensive. And, but the FDA approval and the loan uh, were documented good long-term outcome. And uh, RBOT obstruction is not a contraindication and low profile, she's profile. And self expandable valve, they, we have handmade valve, venous P valve, pasta valve, harmony valve. This is handmade valve by our surgeon. This is take from the, the, uh, the, Cover stand, and they cut it and uh, make a, a cortex valve inside the valve. And this is case we used before. LP. This is case uh, tetrafalot, uh, maybe forty, more than forty years, and LPA coming from uh, Elta. So the surgeon re-implant the 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 LPA to RV, and severe PR cause the patient cannot win from. Uh, respirator after a pneumonia. Uh, so we implant the valve like this also. Sorry. Ah, what happened? Sorry. Okay, so this case uh, uh, after pulmonary valve because Replacement, 
the, the heart size becomes smaller. And now come to venous P valve. This is a self expander valve still under clinical trial. And uh, this made by a Chinese company called uh, Qi Min. And uh, uh, selection, the, the criteria is all, almost the same with uh, the, the other valves, but uh, they can implant in patient with uh, poor valve annulus major more than uh, 30 millimeter. And uh, the especially in Taiwan, the surgeon like to use RVOD patch, their free PR and large poor valve annulus. And uh, this self expanded valve, valve needs a big sheet, 26. No, okay, no balloon required. Thank you. After that, okay, no PR. And even in patient where with LPS, then we can use that. So I'm going to skip this one. This final position. The stand here. Okay. So we have 15 case experience, and unfortunately, one had endo infected endocarditis at six months uh, after implantation. We give six weeks antibiotics, and also their Y fracture in the same patient, and uh, the, this uh, bandage of venous P valve. The uh, you, we have to use 26. French and fracture of the frame in 27% of patient and infected endocarditis and valve migrations. Recently, we have the experience of use pasta valve. This valve is made by Korean, a Korean company. And uh, this valve, I think, uh, is, is the better valve than pasta. And this is the case with, also with LPS stent. You know, Many of our kidney have a stand in the branch pulmonary because sometimes the, the shunt in the in early childhood make the pulmonary uh, distortion. So we need the stand first in the, the pulmonary. And you see the, okay, then start to open the valve. Okay, so this is the final angel. So expandable valve, no, that don't uh, lead, need for uh, pre stenting and no dentin don is required. You should choose the, you know, you know, it's very easy to deploy the. The, the valve in the port, distal LPA, then repositionable before complete deployment. You can sometimes adjust a, a little bit the, the position of the, the valve and fit for majority of RVOT anatomy, even with a stand in the first branch of PA and suitable for patient with a larger pulmonary valve annulus. And for past the valve, it, uh, upper limit is 30, and for venous P-valve is 32 mm. And uh, this, the study of uh, Mandy valve and venous P-valve, the RVN does the volume index decrease significantly in majority cases, and the RVOT ejection fraction increased. So I, I would like to conclude that uh, both balloon expandable valve and self expandable valve are safe and effective for transcaster pulmonary valve replacement. The self expandable valve can be deployed in patient with uh, native, both native and uh, large RBOT, and implantation of balloon expandable valve need presenting in most instances and should both with uh, with a concrete. So thank you very much.
Uh, thank you, Professor Wang, for your excellent talk. Because we have a, a panel discussion after the, all the lectures, or well, maybe we have a discussion uh, during the time. And the next speaker uh, is uh, Professor uh, Wei Xian Yin. And Professor Yin um, has done a few cases of uh, um, pulmonary valve in, valve, uh, in our hospital. So he will give us a talk with uh, transcaster pulmonary valve in valve replacement. Professor Yin, please. Thank you for your kind introduction. And uh, I would like to present a case of a transcaster pulmonary valve in valve re replacement. Unlike the Professor Wang, who has been the uh, most experienced uh, operator of uh, pulmonic uh, intervention in Taiwan, and he is also the master uh, in this field. In our uh, center, the experience on treating uh, pulmonary valve disease uh, is limited. So uh, as, as uh, Professor Wang already said, that uh, because of the improving uh, uh, medical care, the natural history has led to more of the adults uh, with uh, congenital uh, heart disease can dip into the adulthood. Uh, nowadays, 85% uh, of patients can uh, can live into adulthood, uh, survival, uh, surviving to adulthood. And the long-term issue regarding the uh, congenital heart disease patient uh, would be the patient think that uh, believe they are cured. The reality is that they were not. And the lesions involving the RVOT are common, and the patients are subjected to repeated operative uh, interventions or in, uh, of increasing uh, risk. So, uh, sorry. Oh, sang it down. Okay, uh, actually very few devices uh, were designed or dedicated to, uh, to, to, to this di disease because of the smaller population of patients. Uh, the outcomes uh, data are still sparse and uh, uh, during the op operation uh, we may need our resources and in many cases uh, even a leap of uh, faith. So congenital lesions that affect the RVOT include many kind of congenital disease. One of them is a tetralogy of followed, uh, which is the case uh, we will present later. And uh, uh, this topic has been covered briefly, reviewed by the by the uh, Professor Wang already. Uh, as we know, for the tetralogy. Uh, Follow a total correction, including the VSD patch and the RV widening. However, over time, the 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 primary regurgitation will cause problem, and the, the residuals of tetralogy of of uh, repair is uh, the severe primary regurgitation. Uh, to 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 treat this. As uh, Professor Wang already said, uh, we may need uh, to intervene uh, with surgical uh, intervention or transcaster intervention to correct the severe artery uh, regurgitation. Otherwise, the patient may suffer from uh, ventricular tachycardia or even sudden death. Uh, however, it is not a uh, once for all treatment. So we may need a repeated valvular intervention. <clears throat> Even you implant the uh, pulmonary valve uh, in for the for the pulmonary, uh, pulmonary regurgitation, the valve longevity was only about uh, ten to fifteen years. So the patient need a repeated uh, intervention. Our case was performed uh, last year during the, this uh, meeting. Uh, the operator is me and uh, Dr. Yong Zai Li, and the patient uh, is a. Uh, 18-year-old uh, uh, boy uh, who uh, suffered from uh, one episode of fainting spell after exercise uh, one month prior to entry. The patient had history of uh, tetralogy of fallow and received a total correction at the age of two months. And uh, because of severe pulmonary regurgitation, <coughs> he underwent a St. Jude medical epic valve, 21 millimeter, for pulmonary regurgitation, uh, the, the valve was uh, uh, 
uh, to to place in the Pamonica position in 2009. Uh, he also had a, a complete heart broke and uh, underwent uh, DDDR uh, pacemaker in 2013. Because of repeated surgery, the patient have some mental, uh, I would say, depression, and, and no matter. No wonder, I mean. For, from the hemodynamic study, you, as you can see, the RV pressure systolic was uh, 88, and the PA pressure was only 21. So there is a trans, uh, permanent valve pressure gradient of uh, 67. And the area measured was uh, 0 0.7 only. So, because uh, the 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 serial echocardiographic follow-up showing that the transvalvular gradient was increasing, and that the patient had a fainting spare. So we discussed with uh, the patient and uh, his family, and uh, we all think that. Uh, maybe a repeat surgery would be better, but the patient denied, declined the, the surgery and they would like to uh, seek a uh, transcase solution. So if we uh, uh, use the app, we can see that for a uh, EPIC 21 millimeter, the true ID uh, should be 17, so it's uh, really small. And uh, from the CT, we can also measure that it really uh, was uh, around uh, 17. So it's a very small surgical valve. Regarding the RVOT uh, anatomy, it's still a usual one. That means it's a type one or pyramid, pyra pyramidal or conical sh in shape. So it should be okay uh, in doing uh, intervention. So our plan to do uh, was right femoral approach and uh, temporary pacing from the left femoral vein approach. And uh, we, we will use extra stiff wire. And uh, we, will do, we plan to do ballon dilatation with a 20 millimeter non-compliant true ballon to fracture the uh, surgical valve hoping in doing so we can enlarge the valve area and the imprint a 20 millimeter Edward Sapiens 3 valve. Edward Sapiens 3 is the only uh, valve series wh which have the size of uh, 20 millimeter ones. So that's why we would like to do the procedure uh, like this. Uh, to High pressure balloon fracture of the small uh, dysfunctional valve is doable. Uh, as you can see, if you use a non compliant uh, bigger valve, uh, one or two millimeter bigger than the surgical valve, you can break the processes. Although not all surgical processes uh, can be broken, but in some of them, including the epic valve, it can be done. Uh, successfully. So the procedure start like this. We use a uh, tube uh, for pre dilatation However, it seems that there's still waste. And after that, we deliver the sheets but, and the device. However, it was really difficult to cross the valve, the stenotic valve. The device even got stuck. So we retrieve the valve and use a nucleus balloon for another predilatation. However, as you can see, at high pressure, the balloon burst. And the balloon, when we retract the balloon, the balloon gets stuck uh, in the in the delivery sheets. So we use a caster to shaping the balloon and uh, we throw it. As you can see, one half of the balloon was detached. So we wire the wire, the stiff wire to extra stiff wire to the left uh, inferior pulmonary vein, ho hoping to change the angle of entry. Finally, we can 
uh, insert the valve, cross, crossing the surgical bioprocesses, and uh, deploy the valve successfully. Unfortunately, the valve was not open fully, and uh, the residual grading was 42, which is uh, actually unacceptable. So we try first post dilatation with uh, uh, atlas gold. We did that. Uh, we hope that we can uh, conquer the waste. The first time and the second time, as you can see, the valve is really, really hard to expand. At the first time, uh, at the third time, the atlas balloon <laughs> broken, burst. So we have to retract the balloon. However, we can't. The the balloon hook on the the frame of the uh, sapien three balloon. So it is really scary. Although the hemodynamic is okay, because uh, we try many effort, we advance it and uh, twist and uh, trying to withdraw the balloon, but we can't. We even try uh, kissing wire technique or kissing balloni technique, and still cannot retrieve the balloon. Finally. Uh, we got an idea that maybe it's something like an opened, semi-opened umbrella with a tail hook on the, hook on the edge of the, the, the bar frame. So we use a snare to fold, to fold the distal portion of the balloon and bring it in like we did to retract the umbrella, then we were successfully that can retrieve the whole system. Then we measured the gradient, and the gradient was uh, twenty. So uh, we we do don't want we we did doesn't like to do another uh, procedure. So as you can see, there is a tear here, and uh, I think the tear hook on the frame. So. We can accept uh, a post-procedure transfer velocity gradient of uh, 20. At one year follow-up until now, the patient was uneven, uneventful and in functional one to two status. So I think it was a scaring, horrifying ride, but actually we did it. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. Uh, the third speaker will be uh, Professor Li Yongchai. Uh, uh, he going to talk about the transcaster tractor valve involved involved in ring. Uh, Professor Li, please. So the next is the uh, tricaster valve involved and the uh, valve in ring. That's so I will show you two cases, and uh, we have done two valve involved and uh, one valve in ring and hope you can have some idea about this procedure. The first one is 62 years old female. She received metallic aortic and mitral valve in 1998 for rheumatic aortic stenosis and mitral stenosis. However, progressive leg edema and severe tricuspid regurgitation. So she received another procedure with a tricuspid valve repair and uh, put in a 26 millimeter at the wall MC some tricuspid ring. However, recurrent uh, tricuspid leakage after after two years and uh, she complained about leg edema and uh, and uh, general weakness. So the echocardiography show here here is a uh, severe TR and uh, the pressure grading is uh, 24 over 24 and uh, mitral flow is okay. And uh, you can see severe TR, and uh, that's uh, just like free TR. So the, here is a MC sun 
you can see it's a 3D shape, not perpendicular, and uh, it's uh, one arm higher and uh, one arm lower, and uh, usually the 30 is a uh, uh, AP diameter, but, but not a uh, uh, circular type. So it's hard to say the real metro area. And uh, from multi-style CT, we see here that the 21 area is 360. However, when you project it a little bit, and uh, it's uh, 410. So that's, uh, it's quite confusing for us to choose a correct valve size. And uh, the IBC angle is uh, around 56, and IBC to RB is 111. So from the SVC seems like a little bit difficult when the rotation, so we choose the IBC, it's more easier to control the, the valve. So it, this is a TE from the, the procedure, and uh, you can see here is a free TR, and uh, the, the valve is, a, a the rotation come out from this open area, and uh, it's a cut typical to re, to do that. So that's a uh, we. So we is a uh, the, the we use because the the F thirty R is got quite difficult to implant a uh, pacemaker. So we did a uh, did into RB first because the F thirty implant a uh, uh, valve that uh, we never do pacemaker again for this case, so we preventive insert a, a permanent edit into RB and uh, through the, 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 the annual serine. And uh, then we insert the, the stepping valve 26, and uh, here you see we need to, to have a lot of curve and angling and rotate the valve into the, the RB and uh, the that you see here, the we usually use the R, R IPB for the the wire and the, the bulb is in position. So we hope this annulus is uh, around below the annulus bulb is uh, twenty percent or thirty percent, and above the bulb is uh, around seventy percent. So this is a correct position. So over after overdrive pacing, we do a balloon testing. And uh, with uh, uh, 23 balloon, and uh, it's not called the TR. So you can see here is a T probe, and uh, see if this could up occult all the TR. However, the RV was occulted like balloon, so sometimes it's not hard to say the size is correct. And then the bulb is ready, and the overdrive pacing and the TE monitor. And usually some suggestion that uh, you do not need uh, the overdrive. However, we need more control for our valve, so we still do the overdrive pacing and uh, use the TE guidance. So that's the overdrive 180, and uh, slowly inflation because the uh, balloon inflation, the angle will tilting a little bit, and uh, finally the, the is a little bit tilting. However, the the bulb is, is uh, in the correct plane. So, so we check the TEE. They are quite much of a vegetation, and the bulb function is good. So we what's the next is without any pressure gradient. We try a balloon dilatation with one cc more. So the, because the everything was withdrawn, so we, we, we try again for, for wiring and put in the, the, the balloon into the, the tricardial valve. It has cost a lot of time to, to cross in because after a valve, that's, uh, it's got very difficult. Sorry. 
after all over inflation, the power, the TR was decreased. So we decide to to close the the procedure. Yeah, it it open more, and. Uh, The still have some T up around the, the open ring, but it's decreased, so we stop here. After the one year, the reputation become mild because the S3 have the shoeing skirt and the stops this this area and uh, this two area, and uh, this is a low flow area. Still have some high flow area here, so we now we follow up and still have some high flow from this area, but this low flow area was stopped reputation. And uh, the second case is uh, is the uh, dismal exertion and the palpitation for three months, and uh, she received Epstein anomaly. She is uh, underlying disease Epstein anomaly, so he received tricardic bulb replacement in 2016. After three years, because we did not give any any coagulant, so the the perimang is was failed. So the, the, because the patient complained about the first time surgery and uh, he, she did not hope to receive any open heart surgery. So as like a severe TR and the pressure grading was 5, five over 10 and the uh, area was 1.5. So the, the patient need the uh, track of lab replacement. And uh, you know that's uh, it quite, quite difficult to evaluate from T about F the valve after check up recitation replacement because here a lot of drop out so that's uh, it's uh, quite challenging for the echocardiographer. And uh, here is a multi slide CT and uh, if you have uh, acquired whole face you can see the valve tissue was not quite open and uh, one deep date was thrombus and uh, become sickening. And uh, the area one six hundred or forty two, and uh, the perimeter was ninety one. And the angle is, is uh, one hundred and twenty, and the two the PV was ni ninety five. So the target is uh, it will make nine is thirty one millimeter, and uh, we use the uh, twenty nine sepin three and uh, skirt at the RA side and the three more over PO. Hope this can done well for these cases. And uh, now you can see the uh, Epstein stamp anomaly was not in normal position of tricard bulb and uh, uh, the tilting the, the tilting tower uh, P PA and uh, usually we put, when we do a tricard bulb in bulb, the wire tip should be at the apex is more controlled. However, for this case, it's a TLT into the pulmonary artery, so that we use the RISP, RIPV for the, the wire support here. And uh, we do a uh, balloon angioplasty first. We, this is might be not indicated for every case. However, we hope to put more control for our or push valve into the RV, so we do a balloon test, balloon predilection, and then the valve was assembling it at the IVC. You need to know that the, there is not enough space for assembling the valve, so that she should not push it all the way into the, the IVC. And then we, 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 the valve is ready to the position and uh, still have some resistance and uh, we can and adjust a little bit more with the uh, uh, wheel, angling wheel. And uh, this is more easier for than previous cases. And uh, now we start to inflate the tricai valve with overdrive pacing. And uh, we usually overdrive the, the, the the procedure because the, the, it's got easier, and uh, we this patient have to to epicardially adjust it before surgery. So that we use the mechanic program to start the rapid pacing. So the pacing on.
uh, inflatable balloon and uh, at least motor slow inflation can adjust the valve a little bit. We hope the skirt under uh, the valve is around two millimeter or one millimeter and hope the area open well. And uh, here is a good position of the valve. And uh, this is the last picture. So that's uh, our limited experience about buying valve at uh, the Chakas valve and the valve in right rim. Thank you. The next speaker is a uh, transcarsi valve. Uh, Zhang Haibo, Professor Zhang Haibo, is came from Beijing Anjan Hospital, and uh, she will lecture a uh, transcarsi valve replacement in native native valve. So please, Professor Zhang. Okay, uh, Doctor Li, can you can you hear me? Yes, yeah, quite clear. Pretty sure your slide, please. Okay. So uh, can you can you see my slide screen? Yes, uh, it's quite clear. So that uh, we can see your slide. And uh, yeah, it's big one. Uh, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, a new uh, Chinese design. It's a septum anchor uh, transcaster to cast me well. Uh, we call oh, it. The name is uh, looks well. Uh, and we will share our experience. We all know the tricuspid valve regurgitation. Uh, actually, it's, uh, it's common uh, in, uh, in Asia countries and also uh, in the United States and the U Europe. Usually, uh, these patients with very big red atrium and a very big red, uh, ventricle with uh, red heart failure, many of the patients cannot do the open heart surgery again. So that's why, uh, and also the mortality uh, rate is very, very high. Uh, uh, actually, uh, not in only in China, in, uh, in all the world, the re reduced surgery for the uh, red heart failure and the tricuspid valve uh, operation uh, brings more uh, risk for this kind of patient. So that's why uh, in the world, uh, um, many uh, devices try to do the tricuspid valve repair or even the replacement. So uh, from the slide, you can see there are many uh, still in the trial. Uh, it's not uh, actually not uh, available for the commercial use. And uh, for the tricuspid valve replacement, there are different kinds of ways. It's uh, either in the tricuspid annulus or even not in the tricuspid annulus at all. So, uh, and also it's uh, can be divided into the cell expandable or balloon expandable. Uh, from the, the data and the uh, paper, you can see um, you can have many choices, but uh, that also means you do not have the perfect uh, devices for the tricuspid well replacement or repair. Uh, for the uh, tricuspid uh, uh, transcaster replacement, uh, you, uh, the first one tried in the, in the human trial is uh, navigate. Uh, from the left side, you can see the photo, the picture. Uh, and this one is the first one to use for, uh, for the uh, human. And uh, also, actually, it's uh, a promising one. Uh, we, we all know the tricuspid well annulus is different from the mitral and the aortic annulus. The tricuspid annulus and the leaflet is uh, very big, is uh, soft and fragile. And also, it's a three-dimensional shape. It's ir irregular and it's not easily monitored and checked from the echo and even from the floor. Uh, the tricuspid, the urinary get enlarged very much uh, from the uh, left side well disease. And uh, actually it's, uh, it's a difficult through the uh, red ventricle impacts or even from the uh, transformer wind. The looks well, uh, this is a, uh, short uh, video to show how it designed and how it worked. Actually, it has a, a, a different design anchor system to the septum just below the membrane, uh, membrane part. 
and also they had the clip to uh, gasp the anterior leaflet of the uh, tricuspid valve. This is a, a example of the enlargement of the tricuspid valve and uh, uh, very severe representation from the transatrial way, from the red atrial, the shells is get into the tricuspid valve. And uh, with the help of uh, echo and flow, first uh, we can deploy and uh, make the right angle. The anchor system should uh, detach the septum and then release the red atrial part. It's a very big part. Uh, you can see the, the, the clip, two clippers to, get, to catch the anterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve. And uh, another side is the uh, anchor system to the septum. So these two parts help the uh, looks well uh, fixed and they're not depend on the radial force. So the, if the uh, red, red heart can systolic and then astolic, it's the uh, two layers of the valve. The, in, the internal uh, inside uh, the valve is uh, uh, 28 or 30. It's uh, big enough for the tricuspid valve function. So uh, for the looks well structure is uh, uh, designed for some other uh, features. The class the collapsers and the leaflet fiction to catch the anterior leaflet. And also uh, we just mentioned the septum anchor system. Uh, and also the disc has two layers, it's very soft. So for the uh, red heart uh, can move easily. And also uh, the leaflet of the looks well is uh, a bowing uh, pericardium tissue. The two layers design the inner side is uh, right now is a 28 and a 30. It's uh, big enough for the uh, looks well for the tricuspid valve. And uh, this is a, a picture how it works and how it deploys and release from the uh, right side of the chest, a very small uh, incision, and uh, from the red atrium, uh, get the shafts uh, into the uh, red atrium and the uh, penis. Uh, uh, get through the tricuspid annulus. Uh, uh, this is the delivery system. It's a uh, 23 French uh, introduced chest. And uh, there is some uh, photos of the animal uh, animal uh, ex experiment. Uh, uh, it's follow up for uh, six months, and uh, the looks uh, the wild works for. Great. Do we still have a line from China? <laughs> Professor Chang, are you still there?
Maybe, maybe we just uh, ask Alex. Is Alex still here? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so let's uh, we begin your topic first, and uh, later the Professor Chang here, and we ask him talk uh, the uh, the final part. Okay. Professor Alex is uh, from the Hong Kong Chinese Chinese Hong Kong University, and uh, he was expert in echocardiography and uh, mitral and uh, tricuspid intervention. Mm -hmm. So please, uh, Alex, for uh, give us a topic in tricuspid valve repair with a transcaster way. Please. Okay, but uh, uh, I cannot share my screen when uh, Professor Zhang is still sharing. So maybe the host have to turn off uh, Professor Zhang sharing first. They cannot share both screen. Well, let's uh, give a short talk uh, about the uh, discussion from previous uh, section. And uh, I have a question to Professor Wang. Does, uh, do, do you have experience of balloon dilatation for PV? And uh, which kind of balloon do you use? Uh, the uh, regarding balloon dilatation, because uh, in small baby we use uh, the the a lot of like a new med new med balloon is uh, for small baby new med balloon is very soft and easy to use, but for adult we use so called double balloon technique, and uh, maybe diameter twelve to twelve or to 14 balloon, and another one is use an uh, Inova balloon, is also very good. So to use the balloon dilatation for poor, poor valve stenosis. Okay, so another ex question from the internet. So that's uh, some surgeon was uh, total removed the leaflet of PB, and uh, that is have uh, some effect on future transcaster bubble replacement in your experience? So uh, the I, I know some surgeon not really uh, they remove all the valve. They just put a patch that the so-called uh, not not really patch is a kind of the uh, the the artificial uh, leaflet. Mono, we call it monocusp to prevent uh, severe PR after surgery. But actually, we find that it's not a reliable tool because of the PR will progressively occur after after that. So called the not really the surgeon not really removed all the valve. They just put a, a monocusp. We call it a monocusp technique, and this these cups can last it for maybe a decade. Or so after that, the PR still occurs and need a uh, pull bar replacement in the future. Since we have uh, Alex online, so please Alex, go on. Okay, thank you. So can you hear me? Okay, good. So um, I'm going to share about some experience on transcatheter tricuspid valve repair. Um, so the previous speaker has already highlighted the importance of um, transcatheter therapy because of the high mortality of um, transcatheter valve surgery. And uh, ECHO has played a very important role in uh, guiding the management of transcatheter transcatheter valve uh, therapy. So uh, there are several 2D ECHO views uh, that can be used to examine the transcatheter valve, but uh, I would like to convince you that uh, with 3D ECHO, you actually don't need to do all those uh, uh, 2D view separately. You just need to acquire a uh, 3D echo image from the apical windows with an RE focused view, and then you can reconstruct in the, off, either offline and uh, with the recent technology also in real time all the uh, necessary uh, cross sectional imaging planes to show different trackers with valve uh, leaflet and fabrication. And this is an example here you are looking at the trackers with valve from the right ventricular perspective. And this green line here is cutting a plane cross that crosses the uh, anterior leaflet and the septal leaflet. 
and this is where we want to put our tractor split clip at the end of septal cryptation. And this green thing here can be shown on this right upper quadrant, showing this is the anterior leaflet and this is the septal leaflet. So this is all you need, a 3D echo guided uh, to the plane reconstruction. Um, I would like to also um, draw your attention about the difficulties of tractor split valve imaging with uh, TEE uh, as compared to the TEE of uh, mitral valve. Mitral valve, we often can see very nice tractor uh, 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 images in both 2D and 3D and uh, also the clip of uh, orientation, etc., because uh, the esophageal uh, probe uh, is emitting ultrasound that is uh, perpendicular to the mitral plane and parallel to the uh, mitral clip uh, system. So you have the uh, mitral clip going like this, and uh, usually the ultrasound will be, um, images will be very nice because um, the mitral valve act as a mirror that can uh, reflect ultrasound to create nice images and also uh, the distance between the esophageal probe and the mitral valve is very close. And also the ultrasound is parallel to the uh, uh, delivery system of the mitral clip such that uh, when the arms of the clips are opened, uh, they, they also form a very nice mirror to reflect the ultrasound and then produce nice images. On the other hand, the trigusbit valve is actually at a, an angle um, of um, insonation uh, from the uh, TEE ultrasound transducer. So uh, it does not act as a mirror that can reflect the ultrasound nicely. Therefore, uh, it does not create such a good images uh, than the mitral valve. And also the uh, distance of the tricuspid valve is uh, greater uh, from the esophagus when compared to the mitral valve. And this also leads to a um, suboptimal images. And making things even more challenging when we um, steer the mit mitral clip or the triclip to the tricuspid valve like this, the ultrasound is blocked by the proximal clip arm. Therefore, you will see either blocking or view of the distal part of the clip arm, and also, or maybe you will see a lot of reverberation artifacts that um, interfere your imaging. Therefore, uh, TE uh, imaging of the tracker split valve is difficult, but uh, I'm going to show you that uh, it is possible and with a careful manipulation of the TE probe and 3D imaging, we'll be able to uh, overcome these difficulties. Uh, but I have to admit that in some scenario, uh, ice, intracardic echo, where you have the um, uh, uh, ice uh, transducer uh, within the right atrium looking directly, from the uh, right atrium at the tracker split clip. Um, if the plane is uh, correct, then you get uh, also pretty good um, uh, uh, tri clip uh, imaging. Therefore, eyes would be a very important, um, uh, I would say the complementary imaging approach to TEE in tri clip therapy. Now in the previous uh, lecture, about one hour ago, uh, we have to talk about the different uh, TEE imaging planes for the tricuspid valve, so I'm not going to repeat, but I would just like to summarize, these are the essential views that we'll be using uh, in tricuspid clip imaging. Namely, uh, the uh, RV outflow inflow view uh, at the mid esophagus and the uh, orthogonal uh, four chamber view, this is kind of an inverted uh, right, a mirror image inverted uh, uh, four chamber view where you see the septal leaflet and the anterior leaflet if the imaging planes on the uh, RV info outflow field is uh, putting across the anterior leaflet here. And this is an important structure, papillary muscles. If you see the papillary muscles uh, and the, the chordae supplying uh, to the two leaflets, then these two leaflets must be anterior and posterior because the anterior papillary muscles supply chordae to these two leaflets, uh, but not the septal leaflet. And you have the transgastric view where you can see the uh, all three leaflets simultaneously and you have the uh, mid esophageal 3D view where you see the um, uh, septal leaflet, anterior leaflet and posterior leaflet. And it is important um, to have the orientation right. I usually put the atrial septum, uh, I, just, I recommend it to be put at, in, at uh, nine o'clock such that you have the uh, anterior septal commissure at about 11 o'clock 
um, and uh, you are aiming the clip towards this anti-receptor uh, coaptation. Now, uh, the interventionist has to understand the 3D echo uh, images very well uh, in order to um, achieve uh, 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 procedural success. And uh, also they have to use uh, fluoroscopy to guide their insertion of the uh, 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 CDS system. And what they usually do when the uh, guide is, is uh, coming out from the IVC, the clip is usually pointing directly towards the atrial septum. And they have to be very careful not to push too much because there may be limited space before they will uh, uh, accidentally puncture the atrial septum with the clip. And they have to be very careful and look at the TEE. And what they do usually is counter rotation of the guide to uh, steer the clip away from the atrial septum. And then they use the A knob, a mesquite A knob, to bend the uh, CDS towards the uh, tricuspid valve. And they do it very slowly and at the same time. Now, for those of us like images who do not understand what the interventionists are exactly doing, I try to use this schematic diagram to explain to uh, the images uh, how to uh, co cooperate with them. So if um, this is uh, looking at the uh, triacuspid valve from the RA, the atrial septum is at nine o'clock. The guide is coming up here from the inferior vena cava. So if you see that, if you push the, push the uh, system, uh, advance the system, then the clip, the system will be going towards the anteroceptal commissure, where is the goal uh, of the uh, clip usually. And if you withdraw the system, then you're going towards more to the posteroceptal commissure. If you, if, if the interventions want to go more septal, then they will, uh, they will clockwise rotate the guide such that the clip will go more septal. If they counterclockwise, then the clip will go more lateral. And uh, they can also ban the clip system. So increasing the strictening it or bending it by using the A knob. The A knob is miskeyed in the, uh, if you are, we are using the traditional mitral clip system for the tricuspid valve clipping intervention, we will miskey the A knob such that the A knob function like the, like the M knob uh, of the uh, uh, actual mitral clip. So its function would be to ban the uh, clip delivery system. And if you bend it, then the clip system will go down more towards the postereceptal commissure. And if you extend it, then the, the clip system will go more up towards the uh, anteroceptal commissure. So this is what looked like in real in uh, 2D uh, imaging. So this is the uh, RV inflow alpha view. So here's anterior and posterior leaflet. And the, uh, the guide or the, or the clip uh, is coming from this way. And this is the uh, mirror image of the X-plane, sorry, not the mirror image, the X-plane of the, uh, of the uh, line uh, here. Then you have the inverted mirror image, uh, four chamber view, where you see the uh, septal leaflet, and here is the anterior or the posterior leaflet. Depending where you cut the uh, secondary plane, if you're cutting the secondary plane through the A leaflet, then you got the A leaflet on this plane. If you're cutting, cutting through the P leaflet, then you've got the P leaflet on this plane, while this leaflet, uh, that is um, uh, closest to the septum, it's always the septal leaflet. So in terms of the hands of the interventionist, when they, they can't um, make the clip go this direction by either uh, extending the ANOP or pushing the system more towards this position. If they pull back the system or increase the ANOP to bend the system, they will go more to the posterior position. And in terms of here, medial lateral, they turn the guide, if they turn the guide clockwise, the, the clip will go more towards the septum. If they do counterclockwise, then the clip will more, go more towards the lateral free wall of the uh, tracker spit. All right, so, so far so good. Now the next step after steering would be to check for the uh, perpendicularity uh, of the triclip. Tri so here again, the orientation with the septum at nine o'clock, the inferior vena cava is not seen here, but it should be at six o'clock. The guide is coming all the way up here uh, and this can be illustrated on this uh, cartoon here. And you have the, uh, the mitral clip um, uh, perpendicular to the corruption of the anteroceptal leaflet. So you have to uh, rotate the uh, CDS uh, slowly to uh, adjust the orientation. Uh, usually it's not strictly uh, horizontal to the patient's uh, diaphragm. 
uh, but it's a little bit about 30 degree uh, tilted uh, towards this way, such that the best imaging plane uh, may be a uh, 30 degree imaging plane or 150 uh, imaging plane uh, with the mirror images. So um, I'm going to show you a case. And uh, this is a 678 year old lady with a history of mechanical mitral valve replacement. And she developed late TR and uh, right heart failure. So you see here, the tricuspid valve is here. Uh, it is not a nice image because it's, it's uh, because the mechanical valve is blocking the ultrasound and make this uh, imaging even more challenging. Uh, tricuspid valve imaging is already challenging, but with the mechanical valve, it's even more challenging. So we have to rely on a, a low esophageal view. So what we do is to put the probe all the way down to here to avoid the mechanical valve. And then we flex, anti-flex the probe so that the ultrasound is going this way up to look at the tricuspid valve. Uh, using this uh, approaches, the ultrasound is less blocked by the uh, uh, mechanical valve. And you can see here, we are quite, the probe is quite down. You're even starting to see the coronary sinus. You don't see the right atrium because at here, if the probe is located here, we can actually avoid the right uh, left atrium and the atrial septum and looking directly at the uh, tricuspid valve. And this is a 3D image. Uh, now, um, to be, to be, be, before we start the procedure, uh, we like to also uh, qualitatively assess the severity of the TR uh, using the hepatic vein Doppler. And this showing late systolic uh, reversal in the, um, in the hepatic vein. And we can compare this with the post clip images. Now, the first step is to insertion of the uh, guide wire from the IVC towards the SVC. Now, you can see that here, the IVC is actually uh, not here, it's here. We, we used to think this is the IVC, but this is not, this is the, where the coronary sinus is. This is the IVC is usually not parallel to the atrial septum, but at an angle when it entered the right atrium. Therefore, uh, it is, um, we have to be very careful that when we insert the guide, which does not have the guide wire protection, it is uh, quite sharp and also the clip is quite sharp. If we insert things too much here, we are actually damaging the atrial septum. So we have to monitor the things very carefully with uh, uh, echo at the bicaval view. Now the bicaval view, and now the, you see the clip is, can be very close to the atrial septum. Uh, it's just come off of the clip, uh, not much distance, but it's already hitting the atrial septum. So the interventions is pulling, withdrawing the whole system to leave more room for the clip to come out from the guide. And then uh, after the clip has come out from the guide uh, with the CDS outside uh, of the guide, uh, then, then the, uh, they, they do a counterclockwise rotation and also a, a knock bending of the clip system. And then this is the uh, four chamber view to see that the, uh, the clip is being uh, oriented towards the uh, 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 tricuspid valve with a, a nice uh, trajectory uh, of um, insertion. Now, now we go to the 3D view showing this is an RA perspective, looking at the uh, tricuspid valve. Uh, in this particular view, I did not rotate the images, such as the septum now is not at nine o'clock, but six o'clock, but you can get the idea. So this is the septum, this is the atrial leaf and anterior leaflet, and here is the corruption uh, line between the anterior and septal leaflet, and, and uh, the clip is now perpendicular to the corruption line, and then, Grasping view, we'll go back to the uh, four chamber view, um, a low esophageal four chamber view, and we need to see the both clip arms widely opened uh, in equal length and to catch on the uh, both the septal and the anterior leaflet. And then uh, with the closure of the leaflet of the clips, uh, then um, with a, a reduction of the tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, in this case, after uh, insertion of the first clip, uh, there is still severe uh, TR, although it reduced a little bit from torrential to severe, but it's still uh, quite a bit of uh, severe TR, TR uh, adjacent in, infralateral to the first clip. Therefore, we implant a second clip, repeating the procedure. Now, the 3D view is very useful here to, to guide the position of the clip. 
Now the clip is clearly adjacent to the first clip, inferior to the first clip, and then it is perpendicular to the line of rotation. And then again, using the four chamber view, uh, the low esophagus is at the low esophagus, um, then uh, the clip is closed. And uh, after the clip is closed, you can see the leaflet motion is immediately reduced. And this is, this is a good suggestion of a, a leaflet uh, capture. Okay, after uh, uh, closing the first clip, now you can see the two clips side by side at the anteroceptal uh, for a commissure. This is sort of a low esophageal transgastric view where you can see a uh, short axis uh, uh, plane of the tricuspid valve. And this is a 3D. Now you can see the uh, we almost create a, a figure of eight sign of the tricuspid valve because uh, we're able to already to, uh, do a uh, tissue approximation uh, of the leaflet at uh, this uh, position by the clips. And um, this is the TTE during the procedure uh, to assess the TR and uh, the TR has um, reduced significantly. And uh, qualitatively, we can also compare the hepatic vein reversal. Uh, in, and in this case, this is the baseline. You see a lot of systolic reversal in hepatic vein that after implantation of two clips, the uh, reversal, uh, systolic reversal have significantly reduced and uh, this hemodynamic uh, 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 advantage can, can is translated into the patient's uh, improvement of symptoms. Um, so we, there is a data, this is a clinical data and it's, uh, of TriClip is now best provided by the TriIlluminate uh, study. It is not a randomized controlled trial, but uh, it is a uh, sort of a registry of uh, using TriClip uh, in patients with torrential severe TR and uh, is able to achieve uh, um, excellent device success, and the um, uh, if, if you look at the study results, uh, we know that the also the functional class, the symptoms uh, of uh, of uh, TR is also substantially reduced after the uh, procedure. So it seems that compared to uh, traditional open heart surgery, a triclip is a viable option for patients with a symptomatic and severe TR uh, with a good safety, very low mortality, and uh, Good, uh, symptomatic uh, uh, and also uh, imaging uh, uh, improvement. Uh, so I think uh, I would like to stop here. And uh, I would also like to, again, make an uh, advertisement for attendees who are not here uh, in this morning uh, that uh, we are announcing the, um, the organization of uh, Echo Asia. Uh, initially, originally it was planned for this year, because, but because of the pandemic, we decided to postpone it to next year in May and it will be held in Hong Kong. And hopefully by that time, uh, we'll be um, able to travel and uh, hope to see you in Hong Kong in this uh, wonderful meeting. Uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. I would like to also thank the uh, Taipei uh, Valve meeting for inviting me. Thanks very much. Professor Chang, do you still online? Yes, yes, I'm yes, here. Uh, hey. Would you like yes. to share the last part of the slide? Uh, uh, I will try just uh, maybe uh, one minute for, can, can, you, can you see my slide? Okay. Yeah, it's uh, okay. Yeah. And uh, I just uh, need one minute to show how uh, in, in or how to do the transcaster transcaster well uh, implantation with the uh, looks well. So you can see my slide, right? Yes, yes. Very clear. Yes. Yeah, the looks well, uh, we do it uh, with a uh, small, uh, minimally invasive, a uh, small chest uh, incision. And uh, from the right uh, uh, atrium, we put the uh, delivery system. And uh, you can see the floor, right? Yeah. You can see the-, the Right, yes. right. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you, you can see the small anchor system and the two clippers to, to uh, catch the anterior lip lip. And then we use a, a three-dimensional echo to get, to get us. First, we will do the anchor system. And then right now we re, uh, release the atrial part. The atrial part of the looks well is very big. Usually is a uh, 60 or even 70s um, uh, millimeter. Millimeters. 
And after the uh, release of the valve, we use uh, uh, angiography just uh, to confirm uh, the valve works very well. You can see from the slide, the almost no uh, regurgitation at all. And also the three, uh, 3D echo shows the position and the shape of the uh, H part of the valve also works very well. So uh, right now that looks well, it's in China three uh, centers. And also uh, just this year, uh, several days ago, uh, Dr. Anshin Chen from the Canada uh, reported the, the first case in Canada is the uh, uh, X-Mix. Uh, it's uh, uh, also the first uh, uh, trial uh, outside China. So I think uh, I, I can close my uh, topic. So can we start the discussion? Yes, yes. It's open for discussion. Uh, Professor Zhang, this is the uh, Cao Dianping from Zhenxin Hospital, Taipei. Uh, hey, uh, yeah, congratulations for your achievement of uh, tricuspid valve uh, uh, replacement percutaneously. And uh, because the, the right side heart is a relative slow flow, how is, how is your end type from body treatment uh, for this uh, kind of patients? How what? I'm sorry. How is the anti-thrombotic treatment? Okay, okay. As we use warfarin. Yeah. We use warfarin after the uh, well implantation at least uh, uh, three months. Usually, we suggest uh, six months, and after that, uh, we use aspirin. We only use aspirin. Uh, we all know that for the uh, right part failure patient, uh, uh, the tricuspid well uh, replacement or even the uh, tricuspid pulmonary uh, well implantation, after the uh, after the procedure, actually the thrombosis risk and even the endocarditis is a, a higher risk yes. compared to the mitral and the aortic valve. Yeah. So in our center, we suggest the patient to be careful uh, both of the uh, warfarin and also uh, prevention uh, of the endocarditis. So uh, your, your, your question is very good. Thank you. Probably the, the anti-thrombotic uh, drug should be uh, given to the patient for a long, for a, for a long period, probably uh, lifelong. Is that correct? Uh, in our center, we would like to suggest uh, uh, six months after procedure, and then we, we will continue to use uh, aspirin for a very long time, maybe, yeah, maybe for the, for the rest of the life. Thank you. Thank you. And I also have a question for the, uh, Professor Wang. Because the uh, uh, transcaster pulmonary valve uh, replacement, I think it is the uh, uh, recent mo most exciting um, um, technique uh, in the treatment of congenital heart disease. So uh, the goal of this uh, technique is to preserve RV function and uh, avoid uh, lethal arrhythmia. So but, uh, regarding the, the timing of this procedure, do you uh, think the timing of this procedure should be the time of this procedure should be earlier than the conventional surgery. No, the, the same. same. The same, same. Because of, although it's easier than surgery, but I think uh, we should apply the same criteria of replacement like a uh, surgeon do. So we, I think the same. Usually we use uh, RV enzymes, body volume, more than 150 cc per, uh, per square meter and uh, RV ejection fraction less than 45 or 40. RV systolic uh, volume index are more than 85, uh, 80 cc per square meter. So th this is the, the well aseptic uh, criteria worldwide for surgery and for valve replacement transcaster. So I think we use the same criteria. And another question is, uh, and uh, if you use the saving valve, uh, we know the saving valve is very difficult to, to deliver because of the large, large profile. And, but once the saving valve comes up to the sheath, it is very difficult to, to retrieve. And have you, have you ever encountered this kind of situation? You cannot deliver the, the valve to the, to the target site, but you, have to, you need to uh, pull it out. So what would you do? Uh, because of the, uh, the, I have no experience of the uh, saving but I think uh, uh, the <laughs> Professor in the, the only guy in the in Taiwan has the, the saving valve in the pulmonary position. Yeah. But for melody valve, yeah. 
uh, the, because of many people always have a good, uh, we have to make a good landing zone and put stand in there. So we have, the, you know, we, we use the so-called BIB balloon, beep, small balloon inside in flat first. So we stabilize the, the, the device so we, there's no room for repositioning after inflation the, the, the valve. But uh, for uh, self-expandable valve, we have some room for repositioning, like uh, uh, the, uh, the pasta valve and uh, the, uh, the, the Venus P valve. So we have some small room for repositioning because we have to make a repeated injection to, to, to make an adjustment of the, the valve. Thank you. I think the most ideal device for for power uh, intervention it should be the smaller profile, yeah. and flexible, and uh, repositionable. I think that would be that would be the best so, device. Uh, yeah, but past club will fit the, the criteria because of 18 French is uh, is 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 good for majority of the past club off. So is there any uh, questions and comments from the panelists and, uh, and other experts? Uh, I have a question for Dr. Uh, Li Yongzai. So can you hear me, yeah, Dr. Yeah. Li? Okay, yes. Okay, yes. yeah, I, I just uh, uh, very uh, impressive of your slide about the well in ring uh, of the tricuspid well. Uh, we all know that the well in well actually a little easier compared to the well in ring because the ring we all know the tricuspid, uh, the annulus, and also the ring is a three, three dimensional. So how uh, how did you how did you uh, to uh, to evaluate the dip into the ventricle and the dip into the uh, right atrium? Because the the tricuspid the, the ring is uh, not a two D dimensional; it's a three dimensional. So what do you suggest? Thank yeah. you. Yes, that's a uh, it got very difficult because when we implant the uh, tricuspid valve in ring, we discuss a lot. Initially, we hoped uh, the thirty percent was in RA side, and uh, after deployment, it's almost uh, that the valve came out. And uh, fortunately, we we implant at a good position, and uh, because we oversize the the valve. The second valve, so the rim open more, and uh, it's sliding a little bit to the the atrium side. So that's a uh, it's quite quite difficult. So next time maybe we should have the next time we should 60, 40, but not 70, 30. Yes, yes. Uh, sitting valve is a short uh, stent valve, so it looks a little more difficult. And for the valve in ring. Uh, in our center, we tried uh, three or four cases uh, for the looks well uh, after the, uh, the tricuspid ring. The looks well is a shorter stint, so uh, a little easier to uh, evaluate the dips into the ventricle and the dip into the, the atrium. So the, for the sipping valve, I think it's a little, a little more difficult. Thank you, very good job. Well, for sipping three, actually on, on the one side the cell was large and on, on the outer skirt side the cell is smaller. So when you open the valve, the valve shortening from the skirt side instead of the large cell side. So I think you can put the central marker just in line with the, the ring. The, then you will end up with a 60-40 or 70-30. So that would be safer. Professor Zhang, I ask a question uh, for uh, Professor Zhang. Uh, so um, congratulations on the, uh, on the uh, very uh, nice innovative device uh, for the tricuspid valve replacement. Uh, do you think it's uh, Will be evolved into a uh, transcatheter approach through the uh, the, the venous system, rather than now it's uh, through the right atrium. Do you see the potential, and if uh, and what is the technical difficulties to to um, uh, to develop such a system? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee. 
a uh, very good question. Uh, in, in, in our center right now, we use the first generation of the looks well. The delivery system is a little big, it's a 32 French. So right now it's a little difficult from the transformer win uh, approach. So we had to use uh, the HO, uh, trans, uh, right HO approach. But right now we are going, we are going, we are designing the second generation. There, uh, this is a smaller one, and it can be used from the transformer win. Uh, but we all know that the uh, why it's difficult to design for the second generation because the uh, red uh, heart failure, the patient, you are a very big red atrium and a very big uh, tricuspid annulus. So the well, the looks well, uh, the size is very bigger than the mitral and the aortic. So uh, it's a, a little difficult to compress into the delivery system. So, but, but I uh, confident for the second generation in the future, the second generation should be works very well because the smaller size. Thank you. Professor, Professor Zhang, that, uh, there's a question from the internet. So how about the issue of permanent pacemaker in Lux, in Lux tricuspid device? Should we put the pacer in it before we implant the, the device? Uh, uh, when, we, when we do the, uh, the Lux well implantation, we do not need uh, the rapid patient at all. And uh, sometimes you know the tricuspid well uh, uh, enlargement and also the, the patient has a red heart failure. The patient uh, usually uh, in our center is, uh, I think the 50 or 60% received the uh, permanent pacemaker before the, uh, the well implantation. But the pacemaker, the lead has, uh, we can just uh, put away you know, the looks well is very soft. So the, uh, the permanent, the, uh, the patient or wear in, in the annulus do not have any relationship with the looks well. So we just uh, be careful, not catch the, the patient wear and uh, we do all the good position to anchor the system. So we can uh, su uh, successfully uh, release and uh, deploy the looks well. And how about the immediate pressure gradient after the looks well implantation? Did they, did you yeah. check routinely? Yeah, the, you mean the gradient after the release, right? Yes. The gradient. Yeah, the gradient usually is, is very low. It's uh, less than uh, five or or, or ten uh, millimeters of mercury. So the last question is. Uh, some from internet as a possibility of RVOT obstruction after we bobby dream or lux device. I think that it won't happen because the uh, shape of RV is uh, uh, like an uh, angle tower to the, the upper world. So that's an issue. It won't be a, a RVOT obstruction after the the valve replacement. So that's uh, I think uh, I just answered. Uh, the question, and uh, maybe that's uh, we have last question. That's uh, I will ask uh, Professor Zhang and uh, Professor Li from Hong Kong. That's uh, when do you think about rubber repair or replacement in tripartite position? Professor Li, still, when do yeah. you think about? You mean transcatheter or yeah, transcatheter transcatheter? Uh, that's a very good question, and um, I uh, think uh, it's obvious it depends on uh, the technique, whether the techniques is available. I mean, not uh, all these techniques are available in uh, all the centers, so we actually don't need to make such a choice because uh, more often than not, we may only be uh, technically using one technique in one center. But if we have all the techniques available, I think um, uh, it depends on the anatomy. Uh, if the uh, anatomy, uh, there are different types of technical limitation. For example, in the tricuspid edge to edge repair, uh, if um, the, uh, the corruption gap is too big and the imaging is not good, uh, T imaging is, does not give a good very good images, then those cases may not have a good outcome. And especially if they have severe pulmonary hypertension, they will not have good outcome with uh, triclip repair. 
they may need to think about other approach. If the um, anatomy is mainly uh, tricuspid annular dilatation, they may need to do uh, annuloplasty. And uh, if um, uh, the, uh, is that the valve is uh, very distorted beyond repair, they may need a tricuspid valve replacement. So I don't think I have, a, I have a very brilliant answer to your question, but I think uh, it depends on the anatomy and also the availability of the technique. Yeah, Professor Chang, still there? So let we, we cross the section, please. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have uh, four, uh, five presentations this morning, two about the pool valve replacement and three about the tricuspid valve replacement. And the, the, the tricuspid valve replacement uh, are very new to me because of the, I think the tricuspid valve is not uh, really the wrong shape. So um, uh, I think uh, these techniques are more, even more challenging than the pool valve uh, position. So uh, I would like to thank uh, all the speakers for their very good uh, presentation. And we, I think we learned a lot. And we, I would like to close this section and, and have hope to see you all next year after the end of the pandemic. <laughs> thank you very much. Have a good day. Okay, thank you all. And I, well, I'd like to thank all of you uh, to participate to this meeting and uh, all the people who are watching this program. Uh, t uh, this time, uh, we have so many world experts and our uh, local, lo local experts to come to uh, join our meeting and uh, give so many lectures, and I think that's a uh, well. It's about a it's a turning time of our technology. I think uh, so. Um, this is very uh, meaningful and uh, very uh, useful for us to learn some more techniques. And uh, there also uh, new devices and also new skill. Um, well, so I think that uh, in the following years we have more and more devices and more uh, technology to come. Uh, I, I think all these are very, very good for the patients. I think uh, that will make this surgery or the treatment uh, even safer. In the, uh, and also uh, uh, because of uh, the change in the, the treatment modalities, uh, I think that it's, uh, uh, the people, the patient will benefit most from these uh, improvements in the technology. And uh, well, also uh, there are so many unexplored the field in the, uh, for, for the treatment, uh, like uh, tricot or uh, In the past, uh, we believe that the probably we can leave it alone, or sometimes we just don't know how to treat it. But in the future, I think the, uh, some explored, uh, unexplored field will be, uh, will be discussed. So this time, uh, I, I thank all of you and to have um, a lot of uh, discussions and uh, brainstorming. So uh, hopefully I'll see you uh, uh, sometime in the future. Thank you.